controlling. I'm kind of okay. I'm kind of warmed up, but not quite warmed <laughs> up yet. All right, Griggs, hold folks. On, hold on. It's Rob. It's for Central Apologetics, and I'm here with a special guest, Joel, Doctor Joel Duff. How are you doing, Joel? I'm doing great, Rob. Thanks for having me. No worries. Thank you. Um, just a quick introduction to Joel. He's a professor of biology at the University of Akron. I got, hope I got that right. Yeah, that's good. He, uh, he earned his BS in biology from Calvin College, a PhD in botany from the University of Tennessee. He focuses on understanding biological diversity by examining differences in DNA sequences and genome structure. You worked on numerous plant and animal systems, authored 40 plus research articles, and um, you're also an active writer and speaker. And in fact, I streamed your uh, 2019 ASA, you know, lecture on the, the hyper evolution that's uh, technically part of the youngest model. And, um, and my fa one of my favorite books actually from Biologos, which you happen to be contributed to is the Grand Canyon a monument in ancient earth. Um, there we go. There's the book. So I have that on my shelf over there, but that's, that's an excellent resource as far as just teaching straightforward geology. You're using the grand Canyon as a, as an anchor point for that topic. And also your, all the authors are basically God honoring faithful Christians just saying look this is what geology says and this as christians this is what we have to how we have to accommodate um not only the biblical narrative but this thing we call noah's flood and carol hill whom i bought her book um it came out in 2019 uh, to do with yeah her um, worldview um, yeah worldview yeah. science yeah i just to give you a bit, bit of a brief context with that i had a hunch Again, when we were discussing John Walton and the engineers and scholars, I had a hunch that the flood was in the Persian Gulf. Back in the 90s, there were geologists. There's one particular geologist I remember reading, basically proposing, what if the flood is in this region, extensive region, and that the Eden location is where the four rivers meet there. And then I'm seeing this Grand Canyon book give a hint about that, and I'm just thinking, okay... <laughs> Something's going on here. Like, in other words, all of the you know the scholars in the field are in private having this discussion. And, uh, I I even interviewed Jeffrey Rose. I'm not sure if you're familiar with. I, I'm Jeff not. Rose. No. He's a, he's an anthropologist who actually is working with early human migration from Africa or into the Arabian Peninsula. Oh, okay. And one of his papers in 2010 that he published was called "The Persian Gulf Oasis," hmm. um, and and I interviewed him twice now on this channel and, uh, you know, discussing that topic, but, but yeah. Uh, so there we go. There's, this is intro to Joel and, uh, thank you for coming on and nice. Make me sound yeah. like I'm really busy. Um, yeah, trust me seeing your, yeah. oh, and plus you have a blog, the, his blog is linked <laughs> in, the, in the description. Excellent blog. Um, just that, but with that blog alone, yeah, you're very busy. So. Yeah. But I'm happy to be here. This is this is uh, I, I I mean I relish the the chance to answer questions. Um, if, Sweet. I Sweet. mean I'm not promising I'm going to be the best. I'm not going to you know <laughs> have the uh, all the answers you want to hear. Um, but it's always a good exercise uh, to be challenged mm -hmm. with things that maybe you weren't expecting to hear. Mm -hmm. it makes you wrestle with what you know and and find out what you don't know. I'll go back and then I'll write a blog post about it to try to figure it out. <laughs> right. Yeah, so speaking about blog posts, um, why the natural historian? Why why that? What's the origins behind that? And yeah. The, the origin behind that is originally originally I well, I've always been a big fan of John Ray, uh, from the sixteen hundreds, one of the considered one of the greatest English natural historians. So natural historian refers to, or, or natural theologian, um, was anyone who really studied nature as a way of trying to understand God in the 1600s, 1700s. 
And so a natural historian, although today the, the connotation is somehow secular, uh, in, in a way it was not so secular uh, at that time because you were trying to trying to appreciate the beauty of the world uh, through and, and understand you know what God has done uh, in his creation. Uh, and so John Ray, but but John Ray in particular uh, was one of the very first people to uh, really struggle with the idea of the age of the earth because he observed fossils. And in those fossils, uh, which at the time were debated, like what, what is a fossil? You know, is it, is it something that was previously alive and, and uh, now dead and preserved? That wasn't the predominating idea, but he saw so many different forms of fossils that he speculated they must be things that were alive in the past. And now I think you, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out that once you start to think that way, you start to wonder, well, when were these organisms alive? You know, when were these muscle shells, uh, which are now on the side of a mountain, where could they have possibly been alive in the timeline, in the, in the chronology of the Bible? Because he was a, he was a believer and he, he would have believed the, 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 the simple, straightforward reading of, okay, the earth is a couple thousand years old. And he wondered how, how it could fit in. And he really struggled really most of his life with that question because he, it, it didn't fit. It just didn't fit. It seemed like it would be a longer time. And by the way, that's that's sort of the that's the origination of young earth creationism is just during just after his time. Because once he convinced others that fossils were really things that represented past live past life, everyone had to deal with the question, well, where where were these things and when did they exist? And young earth creationism with uh, Woodward uh, uh, was one of the big proponents. He said, oh, well, there's this big flood thing, right? You know, this, there was this huge cataclysmic flood that covered the whole world. And maybe that uprooted organisms and preserved them over time. So that, that idea only goes back to that, that point in time, that the flood was a, it's such a chaotic event that it created the entire geological landscape of the earth. Uh, before that, anyone talking about the flood would have just thought it was water rose up and covered some of the land, but didn't actually reshape the earth. It's the, it's the whole reason, the fossils are the whole reason why we had to completely change or everyone had to change the way they thought about uh, the age of the earth. All right, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting on a roll now. I, no, no, I'm better. That was you stop me once in a while yeah. and ask questions. because No, no, no. Uh, that... <laughs> I'm a lecturer, was, so once yeah. I start lecturing, no, honestly, that, never stop. But anyway, that, that's the, that's the yeah. origin of the natural okay. historian. It's just my own interest in that. And I wanted to write about people from the 16, 1700s so you could learn about their wisdom from the past and how they've already answered a lot. They already dealt with a lot of the questions that people talk about today. Uh, and and there's a lot of wisdom we can gain from them. What I, what I discovered very quickly is that if you write a blog post about Cuvier, in the 1700s and use quotes from him that you'll get exactly zero hits to your blog. Um, so, but if you mention Can Ham, uh, you may get a lot more. And although I would love to be, you know, do exactly what I want to do, um, it, it, at some point you have to kind of make some pragmatic choices. You have to write content that people are actually interested in. Mm. So I do try to sprinkle right. in that information. Uh, mm. But originally, the blog was going to be dedicated to that sort of time period. Right, right. Um, just a quick off-the-cuff question in, in light of that introduction with respect then to the origins um, of YEC. So I, my first engagement with um, the topic, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I had that gentleman approached me with that particular book and give this a read. But again, I just couldn't care less with any of that stuff, even religion in general. But when I started to get into the topic, when I became Christian five, six years ago, and so I came across Ronald Numbers works mm -hmm. and, you know, the creationists and yeah. the other one was like something to do with like, uh, like Ga was Galileo in prison? Like a, a, a book on myths, myths of the of church and science, and yeah. And he apparently, as far as I know, is an ex SDA. Yes, that's true. And, yeah, and he was adamant. So I didn't know about this connection that you just mentioned about people just after John Ray, but he all I knew, and even Carl, uh, Carl Gibson. Uh, 
mm-hmm. um, he also wrote a, a, a PDF and with with respect to Biologos Foundation, saying that the that the that, that the true origins of young creationism actually comes from Ellen G. White's visions and her flood geology. But is that is that authentic? Is that half half of the story? Like, yeah. So yeah. it's a it's a little bit. Well, okay. So it's as low as all history is a little bit complicated, right? Right. Um, so what I'm what I'm what I've been saying or what I just said was that in the the late 1600s, early 1700s, you had Woodward. There was a variety of there was a whole bunch of different theories of the Earth at that time. Like, okay. how did the Earth come to be? And there were sort of mm-hmm. pseudo secular ones that were sort of mixed with some biblical mysticism and then there are ones that were tried to be truly biblical and Woodward was one of the first who suggested that the world was reshaped by a global flood and he would have had a strict timeline of you know 6,000 years uh, for the earth and it's this giant flood happened 4,000 years ago and then all the animals that are on the earth today come from Noah's Ark so you could say that 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 is the the origins of young earth creationism in the sense of their flood geology like that that's the nascent idea of flood geology the, the mechanism of how the world could be young and yet still support all this interesting geology and all the biology although he didn't really talk about biology much so then when you're talking about ellen white uh sda from i, I think late 1600 well, sorry late 1900s early 20th century um she um right there's there's all these visions and so forth, but there's a there's another author who, of course, escapes my mind right now, who wrote uh, a book of geology. He was a geologist in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, who then wrote a much more detailed, like here's how the geology of the world could have been reshaped by the flood, and that becomes the inspiration for Morris and Whitcomb, or Whitcomb and Morris in uh, 1953, or maybe it's 1957, 56. I can't remember. You mean George uh, Price? That's... Yeah, Price. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So Price sort of takes the ideas of Ellen White, who who you know saw this idea that this world was young and had this chaotic flood, and mm-hmm. then makes it into a like a uh, you know, something that seems like it's a scientifically plausible thing. Hmm. Uh, and then that inspires Whitcomb and Morris, who then essentially recapitulate his book in the Genesis flood, which then brings it to the broader evangelical world. Um, hmm. So I, I would connect young earth creationism or the idea that the world is, is young and the flood sculpted the earth back to the 16, 1700s. Okay. But there was when you when you get up into the 1800s, virtually everybody had abandoned that idea, right? So so even almost everyone was an old Earth creationist. Now they were anti-evolution in the 1800s, but they were totally accepting of an old Earth at that point. Uh, even the scriptural geologists were not exactly like young Earth creationists today, and so it kind of got refired up then in the 20th century. Uh, and so in that way, you'd say like the modern version of young Earth creationists does trace itself back to uh, sub- Seventh-day Adventists. Right, so that's, okay. the, that's the longer, but I'm sure there's an even more complicated story, but that, that at least gives you a little bit more background. Are you, f- okay, a um, little bit of a random, <laughs> maybe maybe this, this, this will be of interest to you, but in my research growing up, uh, again, with the Genesis studies and reading, say the ancient uh, patristics like Basil the Great in the fourth yeah. century, and so this is Philip Schaff's translation in the eighteen hundreds of Basil the Great, and then he has a footnote under footnote three. So Basil, I, again, I'm interested to, to see your reaction to this, but Basil was wrestling with when he was reading the Septuagint that says that the birds come forth from the waters. He was using language like. I wonder if there's a family link between the creatures that fly and swim. I wonder <laughs> if if there is a common derivation and if they are of one family. And then Basil, uh, sorry, uh, Philip Schaff quotes this French theologian, and his name is, hmm. oh boy, I, I don't speak French, but uh, Jacques Bussol. Bussol. <laughs> yeah, He's... Maybe. He's in 1627 to 1704, a French bishop and theologian renowned for his sermons and other addresses. Um, 
Anyway, well known. And in French, this is what he says. And apparently, according to Schaff, if you can read French, this is a similar conclusion he made. And then Philip Schaff throws this in because in in his day, he's he's familiar with Heckel and the mm-hmm. monophyletic pedigree. And, and it's just like, like exactly what you just said. In the, by the time that you reach the 1800s, everyone's sort of like old earths. And here's Philip Schaff, a church historian, throwing in, oh, by the way, the current theory is that you have birds out of reptiles yeah. or influenced from fish. Based on this early church father quote, um, you know, going back to Genesis 1 verse 20. But um, yeah, that's I just wanted to also show you. No, yeah. no that, that's really fascinating. Yeah. And I, 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 I said, like I was saying at the beginning, my, my blog originally wanted to deal with things like this. Um, I, I, I don't think people understand that it's not like people didn't think 300 years ago. They thought yeah. deeply about yeah. these questions. Um, and it, it helps to see other people struggle with the same questions and, and actually mm. see they've come up with similar answers at times. Um, yeah, but the young earth creationists often paint such a simple story that, that sort of like throughout history, everyone just looked at, open their text and, oh, <laughs> everything just happened in this but many years, there was a flood and then yeah. God created all these organisms separately, but now, well, separately, kind of, they're part of kinds and so forth. But um, mm-hmm. as if there's unanimity throughout history and it's only recently, you know, after Darwin that we've become, you know, post enlightened and, and can no longer think for ourselves correctly. Mm, right. And Stephen Mo- o- Moshia? Uh, Moshia, yeah. yeah. M- Moshia? I think that's how you in, pronounce it. I, I hope. I don't want to mispronounce his name. But he, he uh, contributed to Walton's Lost Will of the Flood. There's a particular right. point I found quite interesting that he made, which I didn't think about before. But in that, he proposed that if you were to take the... Um, the the rate at which the waters you know go Seated. up and then go yeah. down yeah it wouldn't have changed the earth at all it's too slow if you take the 150 days that it's going up and 150 days that it goes away you take the size of the earth pretend it's a global flood and apparently it won't it's so slow it won't even move sand particles if you just take the you know, yeah, and then so you have to of- you'd have to invoke some ad hoc miraculous speed or you know change some basic right. uh, characteristic of how uh, providentially nature functions. It's kind of like the heat yeah. problem too. If if all the plates actually ran around really fast, uh, friction would generate so much heat it would have melted the Earth you know during that time. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. you have to then posit that there was some sort of mechanism that drew away the heat. Um, and that might be a miraculous mechanism or maybe some mechanism that no longer functions today. Um, but nonetheless, it's not a natural, uh, it's not something you would naturally infer from what we can understand about the earth today. Uh, you have to, you have to add that in, mm-hmm. um, to your explanation. Now, granted, if the younger creationists are right and, and the scriptures do describe exactly their interp- if their interpretation is correct, um, and then, so then, yes, maybe there were all these things that happened, um, but that requires a, it's not necessary, I'll, I'll just say. Well, but, but he's making it's not the argument to go that, to that point. Well, he's, he's making the argument that when the young Christians say that the pre-flood world is different to our world, ah, Stephen yeah. is saying, because it's so slow, you won't, you won't know the difference. The world we, we see now today would be the world back then. It's, right, most, just of the, most of the mountains up. and most of the continents would be in the same configuration. Exactly, and you'd have that's slight, his argument. You'd have slight changes here and there. Yeah. Um, a little more sediment this, over here. Yeah, yeah. he's coming at this purely from that physical physics context where just by the granulation of sand particles with respect yeah. to the flow rates, thermo, you know, uh, fluid mechanics and all that. Like, I found that quite an interesting argument he made. Um, um, so, so then, <laughs> there's technically then no evidence for a global flood, even if you go down that trajectory, right? It's yeah. just, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. okay. So, just uh, fill me in more on you as a person, and also as a Christian, and also as 
research scientist and also as a professor like <laughs> like how do like all, all that those get, how, does that, how do you get all those things together in one package that's yeah. like talking to you through this computer um yeah like like what about that before we move forward in these yeah, other no, I, yeah, I, like, yeah i think yeah. that's really important to talk about yeah um, yeah who is this who is this guy and yeah um, yeah so i i grew up in well, a variety of places, but we'll start Colorado. I, I grew up my younger years in Colorado. We, we, I live literally at the edge of town, uh, very close to Utah. Uh, and my background, my, my, my playground was go to the end of the street and go out into the desert and uh, just do stuff. Uh, sometimes get in trouble, but you know, usually finding interesting things to do. But it, you know, that, that really instills an appreciation for nature, especially when the ground is littered with fossils. And so you can collect fossils everywhere all the time. And wow. um, I, of course, I always wanted to, what does every kid want to do? They want to find a dinosaur, right? And I knew that there were dinosaurs in Colorado, and I knew there were dinosaurs not very far away on the other side of town. Uh, and so I knew that I, I was interested from an early age in, in finding those kind of things. And I remember, you know, I remember my father explaining to me, he's like, you're not going to find a dinosaur. You know, it's like, <laughs> is, you're, you're not going to find a dinosaur out here. And what's interesting about what he said was he knows enough geology to know that in this particular portion of the geological column, right, it's neither the age nor the type of ecology or original condition or place in the world where dinosaurs would have been. Um, and that's because everything I found was marine, right? There was all kinds of marine fossils uh, in, mm. in my backyard. Uh, whereas the other side of town was uh, a different layer of sediment that was laid down at a different time when there was, you know, when the, the ocean levels were lower. And so it was land at the time. And what you found was dinosaur fossils and you found plant fossils, right? You, mm -hmm. you found a community of organisms. You didn't just find scattered stuff. You found, you found something that made sense in terms of like an ecology from the past. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so I was like, well, all right. But I think what else would make, what else would, let's see. The other thing that makes what he said interesting is my father's a, a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, he grew up in the church. He had uh, two parents, one of which was a, uh, a pastor as well. The other one was a, an ordained minister who was a uh, missionary to Ethiopia um, with the Orthodox Presbyterian Church here in the United States. And uh, my father was born on the mission field, right? His, his whole life is dedicated to the church. Um, and so, but he had a huge appreciation for the natural world, for God's creation. I mean, we loved living in Colorado and exploring the world. And um, he he was aware of these topics of young earth creationism and so forth. And I, I don't think I really knew that when I was young, right? That, that there were people in the church who I'm sure asked questions, these types of questions and so forth. And so he was had to contend with that. But he left me with that, like, no, there's not going to be dinosaurs there because we know this much about Earth's history and it's very unlikely you're going to find a dinosaur fossil there. So I went from there to Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is a, um, a, a religious school. And um, there I didn't really ex I didn't really have to deal with the age of the Earth question, just like I had in most of my life. And I did, wasn't really familiar with young Earth creationism. And it wasn't until I went to graduate school when I was at University of Tennessee, and I'm I'm in a situation where I'm at a, I'm at a church that is fairly conservative and orthodox, and uh, they clearly didn't believe the Earth was old, and were very anti-evolution and uh, the whole the whole thing there. And then I have people at you know at at the university who are like you know well you're going to this church and what's that about how can you believe that and do this so it really caught between two worlds right two two different like pressures all the time. And I did have somebody from that church who who then took it upon themselves to, uh, I guess, save me or give me some kind of comfort or like help me get through this difficult time of getting my PhD. Like I just feel like I'm gonna somehow, like just like try to get through this. And uh, they handed me uh, Whitcomb and Morris's The Genesis Flood. They're like, you know, here's this great book, you know, that that I have that has really helped me understand the way the world really is and the history of the world. Uh, and so this could, this could be really beneficial to you. So they handed that to me. And when I started to read that, I realized, wow, I didn't really know 
that this was, I mean, I mean, I'd heard of it, but I didn't really understand the depth of, of what they were saying. And I also realized I didn't know how to answer those types of responses. And so that's what sort of kicked me into gear in terms of like, I need to have answers to these things, or I need to actually know what I believe as well. You know, and do I really even know what I believe? How do I answer these questions for myself? And so that stimulated me to, I mean, I spent several years really probably in mostly personal um, uh, investigations and reading everything I could and all kinds of books to try to sort out those topics before I started to dip my toe into email digest. I'm, I'm old, so that was back in the, in the early 90s. Uh, and then going to graduate school and getting more involved uh, in discussions in church and then and having more engagement uh, over time. Yeah, I'll stop there though. Let's. So that's that's a little bit about me. So I'll, yeah, I should say I should say I'm still I'm still I come through that whole process though, still a very devoted Christian, right? I I don't feel like there was any day along the way in which I was like, oh, I I don't know about all this. You know, I I, I question everything I ever knew. I I do attribute that to my father because he, I think I think he 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 set me on a. Uh, on a way of trying to find out things for myself, uh, give me a good grounding in hermeneutics and understanding scripture, and not just feeding us like you have to believe this. And then going to college and being learning more, and then but then really being, uh, once I finally hit the world, right? And the world is like, why do you believe this? And then other people are like in the church are like, well, why do you believe that? I didn't just like pick one or the other. Um, I found that, hey, I, I understand. I'm on board with you theologically. I understand your concerns. Uh, I think you're misguided on this particular topic. Um, but part of that's, you know, you've been fed all this information. Um, but I can still, I still believe the core. I have these convictions that we share. And then scientists like, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And I know what your criticisms of the church are. But you also criticize them for for things that I think that they're ignorant on and not truly the core of what makes uh, makes the Christian faith what the Christian faith is. You're, you're, you're attacking the add-ons, right? That aren't the essentials um, of the faith. And so for me, that journey was fairly seamless. And I know it isn't for everybody, but that also means that that's what I want to, you know, that's why I do what I do and why I try to help others who I think probably have only learned young earth creationism all their life. And they've been told this is evil, this is good. If you have any doubt at all about this, then there's only one direction you can go, and that is you have to go to complete atheism. Um, and that's obviously I don't believe that's true, um, but I see it. I see it mm. all the time. That sounds remarkably similar to my journey. In a in in a weird inverted way, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I didn't have that that. I guess the upbringing you had, my upbringing again. When I say it, it, it's similar but different. So my upbringing, I, I wasn't brought up in a young earth household. I didn't have. I didn't have. My father wasn't, a, you know, a pastor. Like it was just a sort of a given, more like a cultural Christian practice. You know, we go to church. We we, we you know reverence to the Bible, reverence to God don't have time to deep about uh, to think about deep theological scientific issues you know just get along get get on with your life do what you need to do that yeah, was my so, or maybe yeah. a social club this is a this is a good social experience uh yes and but again even more than that a little bit in in other words it's a, it's a, it was a genuine so my folks and in fact my entire heritage is like a genuine for example, because it's it's high Anglican experiences I've been through. So I was born in India, and there's a lot of chaos, <laughs> superstition, and all sorts. I remember I left India when I was nine. I remember people possessed coming mm. into the church demanding help, and but it's it's not like people get freaked out. It's just a given. It's like mm. oh here we go again, um, and. So my folks, they would bend the knee. For example, you know, those little stools, you'd, you'd bend the knee, say a prayer. Like, that's sort of the social club, but at the same time, reverential approach. Uh, you honor the pastor. So the so the pastor would actually stand by the door 
making sure that everyone who's walks out, their hands are, sh- you know, shaking their hands. Like, it's, yeah, it's just one, it's just, it's just totally different compared to when I came here uh, to Australia. And it's so sterile. It's, you know, churches, people just dress in regular clothes. Even the pastor just dress, you know, dresses in a regular clothes. And, you know, but again, I'm not saying we should all become monks and go back into that <laughs> very traditional, you know, but it's different, you know. And so if I were to muck up in, in a personal issue, and if my folks found out about it, obviously that, you know, I'd get a rap and be like, no, that was wrong. Learn from that, you know, learn from these mistakes. But as far as thinking goes, um, so the reason why I, I, I found a, like a kindred spirit with not only, say, recently, say, the works that you've written, but also with, say, Walton, Heiser, or Ross, like all of these guys, is because my... Uh, folks taught me so so Heiser famously uh, is known for saying the world is stranger than you think but thinking should not be strange and that statement alone by definition is my upbringing where I've been <laughs> I was told to just go for it you know even if even if the ideas are really weird but don't hook line and sinker just believe it um so, so when I started to engage with Christians, those particular individuals that come from that sheltered environment, I guess, and, and, and the majority that are now my age, they've grown into the adulthood, and now they're venturing out, and obviously they're in ministry. I'm not, but I mean, I suppose this channel is a type of ministry, but, mm-hmm. but they're actually doing actual ministry because that's their job. It's like, even to this day, I'm perceived as, a, as some form of threat because, oh, you know, there's Rob. He's like not one of us, uh, you know, in, in the youngest fold or, or something like that. Um, I mean, I'm not saying all my, my relationships are like that, but there's a lot of Christians I know, Christian friends that even, even the, the local church that I wrote that Revelation study for, they, they're, they're, let's just say they, and here's another ir- irony, because they didn't have that Americanized, Westernish upbringing, which is that young earth experience, because again, majority of them are Asian. Mm-hmm. They're much more open-minded to, because, you know, they've been brought up to think rationally in, in, a, in a rigid scientific framework and whatever. But obviously it's like feed me they're hungry they're thirsty for well how do you combine biblical theology with the cutting edge cutting edge stuff of science and and so then i suppose that's why i'm able to i mean it's not the only reason but that's one of the reasons why i was very comfortably able to sort of fit into those areas in christendom with the folks like them uh uh, where you know you, you can actually have a dialogue, a conversation. So yeah, it, it, in a nutshell, it I can sort of sense when, when you're explaining the journey to me, I can sort of sense a, a very subtle melancholy in your voice, maybe, but I can relate with that because I get saddened and depressed deep down. I suppress it, but when there are people. And I kid you not, I've even been told this by, by one particular individual that, you know, you're in sin if you believe in evolution. You know, that's pretty harsh. Yeah. Uh, what do you do with that? Um, I recently interviewed Ben Stanhope, yeah. the guy who wrote Mis- yeah. Misinterpreting Genesis. And I also interviewed uh, Inspiring Philosophy when he released that um, 10 Reasons, the Young Earth Creationist video. Yeah, and so right. with both videos, I uh, troll them by saying, "Hey, <laughs> how dare you disagree with a watermelon eating T Rex like in this graphic?" Which, <laughs> which is the sort of thing I I saw when I was coming into this, and yeah, yeah, I I just anyway, but your journey and my journey 
kind of jives a little bit. That's why I I reached out to you because I I uh, binged your your blogs, your blog posts, and I think that particular lecture you gave at the ASA was that was it really. You you were not only were you establishing um, that you have to. I mean, you being the young creationist, you have to acknowledge that this is technically part of your model, and you and you don't realize it. Uh, and um, uh, and then the evolution of the creationist model over time, and especially with that table you you wrote up, like yeah. from the nineties, their propositions back then versus up until twenty seventeen, there was a some studies you were showing. So. Um, yeah, just so just so yeah. others who might wonder yeah. what we're talking about, um, I was in particular talking about their views of speciation or where does biological mm -hmm. diversity come from, and uh, just in a just a really brief nutshell. I mean, you you can Go probably imagine, or some of you probably have met people that believe that God just made every individual species just exactly the way we see them today, uh, and that would have been a prevailing view if you'd gone back hundreds of years. And then it becomes apparent that um, there's an awful lot of species, especially when you start figuring in the fossil record. It's like, well, how would you fit all the millions of different species on Earth into one short time frame? Currently, or one time? Six, is it 8.6 million eukaryotes, eukaryotic species oh, or something? Like, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But even if you just stick to, yeah. to larger macro uh, organisms and the fossil record, that's an awful lot of organisms. and uh, so you have to fit those on the ark somehow, at least the land vertebrates. Because and the so when, when young Earth... show it has to be a lot anyway, but the fact yeah. that we have so much. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that, in that way, young Earth creationists do accept certain facts that are observations. I mean, this is a, we accept observable, ob observation science, right? We, we go out in the world, we, we agree there are a lot of fossils and there's a lot of different organisms that are extinct. Uh, all of those had to be somehow preserved and had to have originated or come from somewhere at some point. And so that's what everybody's trying to explain, right? I mean, er anyone who has any inkling of an interest in why the world is the way it is has to ask themselves, why is there the diversity there is today? And why was there different diversity in the past? Evolutionary biology is just one is one theory to provide a mechanism or an explanation for how life could have changed over time and young earth creationists have another one uh but it but even that model is constantly shifting and changing and so that's kind of what my talk was about is that young earth creationists have come a long way from from sort of adding more and more and more elements of evolutionary theory to their model um they won't call it evolution because they'll very strictly define evolution as just being well evolution is molecules to man or it's like massive changes over time into completely different types of organisms i would say well okay that is part of evolutionary theory but evolution in terms of change and how it occurs in the world and how organisms adapt is is really um a, an explanation for how speciation happens and young earth creationists now accept that speciation occurs and has occurred uh over time and so that's a change in 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 their their thinking uh, over time, and so they're 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 adding more and more elements of evolutionary theory. I'm not making any kind of, I'm not saying that they're eventually going to become evolutionary biologists by any means. Like full full scale, like evolution explains all the the origin of life all the way up to what we have today. But I'm saying that everybody actually does believe some component of evolutionary biology. Otherwise, everyone accepts some amount of evolution. And everybody kind of has to ask the question themselves, like, how much do I accept? And creationists are still trying to work that out. So I should say younger creationists, because I consider myself a yeah. creationist. So I, I have to be careful there. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to use the label creationist just for <laughs> younger creationists. Yeah. So I'll, okay. I'm going to share with you. I guess my creationist model, and I'm interested to hear what you have to say. So, wow, this is great. Yeah, um, all these models. Um, so I'm speaking now with, with with my latest understanding, and I guess my the latest in my maturity, my growth 
and in in wrestling with the Genesis text and the scholarship and all that stuff. Um, I have to agree that all organizations, uh, except those who are purely the, the the specialists with respect to the ancient areas and linguists and all that, all organizations are concordus, and mm-hmm. it's and 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 and. And as you've just briefly explained, you have, a, I guess, the emergence of these concordus approaches relatively recently as well, say within 300 years. Um, but as I also showed, you have concordus of even back in the early church, like Basil wrestling with the text. But it's not like a, it's not like a, a concordus model that they came up with. It's just... Back then, Christians were more interested in the theology, and if they came across something weird, like you know, birds and fish, they 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 would sort of leave a comment, like you saw Basil leave a comment, but they didn't make this make it a wholesale, you know, let's make it a creation museum sort of thing. And you know, no, no, yeah. Um, so that being it's said, a, it's a sideshow to the, mm-hmm. the important topic, <laughs> right? So the hexameron is dedicated to the theology of Genesis rather than. You know, let's make a theme park. Um, I mean, how could they in Rome, especially? Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I. So I, I did have, I couldn't help but see what Hugh Ross sees. I know Hugh Ross is not a theistic evolutionist. He he has a very odd, you know, ex nihilo, de novo. Like literally every second that goes by, God is de novo doing something, at, maybe even at the quantum level or something, and and speciation happens, you know, in that process. Um, but I could he's I, creating he's creating every new film strip in a in a in a movie. Yeah, or something like uh, that along yeah. the way. Yeah. yeah. In which case, um, you can input you can input something new into the next into the next reel or the next piece of film. Um, because right. they're not necessarily connected in, in 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 a way that we might think of connections. Right. So he definitely thinks Adam and Eve. He 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 doesn't see Adam and Eve as having any form of biological connection to the to Luca, for example. Like he literally believes ex nihilo. They they were barred out of the earth, and it's like. But I I can't I can't see that. I I follow him concordantly through. If I was if I was to read natural history into Genesis one verse two onwards, I can see early conditions of the planet, water world. You could shove in there moon formation event, then the the, the atmospheric changes because of the spirits hovering over the waters, life introduced, and that there are Hebrew linguists like John Salehammer, Gleason Archer, back in the nineties, saying you can actually see that the sun exists in day one and. And I actually, mm-hmm. I can actually see that flow through. And then, even Calvin, in his commentary of that verse that Basil was talking about, even Calvin said, "There are atheists in my day mocking this because, because how can there be a relationship between birds and fish?" And so then Calvin's like, um, "Well, I'm just going to leave it to God's wisdom. He did it this way somehow." So that that's communicating to me as I'm reading through. Uh, thousand, well, yeah, the last two thousand years of discussion that people have been wrestling with this, but at the same time, not jumping to conclusions, but being open minded. And I can't help but go in hindsight of, say, the last two hundred years in scientific advancement, advancement, which happens to be from Reformation Europe. You know, this thing called science um, has now completely unraveled the Genesis story, and on top of that. You have to acknowledge the scholarship with respect to the ancient Near East. So, so in other words, you have an ancient Near Eastern concordism that the author of Genesis is having to accommodate because of the superstitions of the ancient Near East. Um, so, therefore, if I was to, in a nutshell, describe human origins, I would say Genesis one is talking about pre-Adam humans, and and it's a very generic thing. And as Walton says, it doesn't end until chapter until verse five of chapter two. Yeah. Then it shifts gears. It's like verse chap well, verse four of chapter two says, okay, now it's now this is the the you know the the the, the genesis or the or the the toledot, the, the the genealogy of the heavens and the earth. 
as you just saw it being created in that first chapter or onwards. In a nutshell, that's what's happened in, in, in one day, <laughs> which is that week-long period. Now let's go into a more localizing event where God funnels down and t- you know sets up his tent, his, his mountain, as Seheiser would say, the Eden language. And then he places the humans that were already there in existence, he places them in this particular spot, and that's the Persian Gulf. And then you get into this Adam and Eve story. So that's my creationist model, is that I see evolutionary history completely in sync with the Genesis account. Obviously, I'm keeping in mind the ancient Aries and stuff, but I'm putting that aside for a moment. Pre-Adam humans, that then leads into this Adam and Eve figure who happen to be high priests in this local vicinity. And then... The rest of the Genesis story is always the drama of Genesis 2 to 11 is always in this region, in the Persian Gulf. Tower of Babel is in this region. Noah's flood is in this region because guess what? The ark still lands in Uratu area, which is that Arad mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm. Um, the Genesis 6, 1 to 4, weird Nephilim thing going on. Heiser will bring out the Yapkalu myth. And again, it's all within that region. In fact, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if you noticed this, but in Genesis six four, when it says that the Nephilim were on the earth, and also afterwards, yeah. you have ancient tradition that says the also afterwards bit is because they escaped westward to Canaan, and that's why you have Joshua's wars rooting out supposedly the Nephilim problem because there's a grammatical point in Numbers thirteen that connect the Nephilim there with the Nephilim of Genesis six. So with the flood in between. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's an extra yod in Numbers 13, 32, 33, where, you know, the report that says these are the Nephilim of the Nephilim, <laughs> yeah. that just that extra yod grammatically, and mm-hmm. Heiser says, brings us out, that it's, it, you, you, it's, not, it's not a stretch, but you could, you, could, you could implicitly bring it out as saying, genetically, it's the same... Like either either it's the same uh, lineage, or maybe it is the same ones from the flood that somehow are still lurking around. Like it's one of the two. Um, it, it in other words, it's not like it's not like the sons of God. If if you do go the angelic view, it's not like the sons of God redid what they did post flood. Right. Um, yeah. The that that species or creature survived in order to then repopulate there whatever they were. So all of this made a lot of sense to me. And then I'm coming across Hugh Ross, Navigating Genesis, he wrote. So obviously RTB has an RTB creation model. I practically agree with like 90 plus percent of it. Biologos, but I, it's the reason why I like Biologos is because um, I really love the fact that they're not afraid to go, hey, come on, we need to also be respectable to the ancient Eastern scholarship and all that. And I'm in the, in between going, okay, guys, I know you're both debating each other. <laughs> it's actually both of you. You're both, you're both, so, so both of you are the same sides of the same, co- like you're both, you know, one of you is one side of the coin, the other is the other side of the coin, but you're both the same coin. Like, so I'm in between going, come on, there's a synthesis <laughs> here. Um, I'm, I'm smiling this whole yeah. time because you're just, you're just, I, I we like I have some kind of mind meld going on here or something because I have a lot of the same thoughts. Okay. A lot of the same thoughts. So I think we ought to explore this a little bit because I think there's some mm-hmm. questions yep. um, that arise. Uh, so, so Adam is, or man is formed, all right, in Genesis 1. Mm-hmm. Adam is placed in the garden, right? He's not, He's not created in the garden. But but Adam is not even named. So Adam just means human. Yes, right. Our right. Humans, so plural. Man is yeah. man is created. Adam is placed in the garden. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you're saying so hu- Genesis I'm one saying doesn't human... so Genesis one doesn't say Adam. It's what you're saying. No, right? so so Adam Adam is in Genesis the word Adam is in Genesis one. How I know Adam oh, is yeah. human generically. That if you go to the King James, the King James does a subtle 
transparent remark, which a lot of people don't know in, in the modern translations. So Genesis 5 verse 2 says, in the King James, it says, male and female are called Adam with the capital A, a King James translation. Hmm. So if you take Adam with a capital A as being a personal name, hang on, a, f- a woman called Adam? <laughs> but that's the point. Like, like, I know the King James translator was transliterating the Hebrew, but that's what's so ironic is that both man and woman are called Adam, but then that word becomes applied to a particular individual, you know, might as well call him Adam. Yeah. Right. Whereas yeah. we know those are not the original names of these people because this is a Hebrew text using Hebrew words and idioms. Like Noah just means comfort, mm-hmm. but in the Enuma Elish and all that, it's the, you know, Utna Pishtun or something. That's his name in, in that figure. But we know, there's a relationship there. The Sumerian king list has a direct correlation with Genesis 5. Um, so I'm, what I'm saying is you have humans of Genesis 1, and I, I suppose, the, the again, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with this, but I know Dennis Menema and a few others mm-hmm. say that there's like a, you can go as low as 10,000 individuals or something with, with the population of humans. Yeah. Yeah, they're using like, a genetic argument and saying that uh, based on the the amount of genetic diversity, mm-hmm. that you wouldn't have a bottleneck down to two. Is there exactly what they're saying? And so, and so mm-hmm. the, the the smallest population, effective population size, that you would have had in the past, in order to project the current variation we have in the population, is mm-hmm. something around ten thousand. And then there's the question of how long ago that was. Um, mm, so mm. those are those are the two those are two really big issues, right? Um, how mm-hmm. long ago was that constriction, and also, um, you know, how constricted was the constriction? You know, mm, is, mm. is everyone related to a single Adam and Eve? And then you have Swami Das, who is, you know, we're all related because of our genealogy. The genealogy Adam and Eve. All right. Thing, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. it. That's it. That's trying to acknowledge that there is a. Um, there's no population that's limited to two individuals um but nonetheless everybody's related to two individuals mm. and swamadas actually is that that very niche like a little sidestep <laughs> approach with respect to those two individuals right you know adam and yeah. eve uh, yeah but um, it's trying it's trying to carve out a little mm-hmm. room for a a more literal reading uh, combined yeah. with you know this nuanced genetic approach right right so all i'm saying is look uh, are you familiar with joshua moritz uh joshua. i know the name i'm not sure that i've i've read a lot since yeah so he actually he, he did this for berkeley he 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 spent like 48 hours like 17 lectures on natural history and 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 Christianity. He's a Christian. And I think he's written for Biologos. Um, but he, his dissertation was all about how evolution theologically, he's a theologian. So evolution fits very comfortably with the early church's notion of theosis and glorification. So if you think about it, Jesus's body is stardust, you know, stardust in a clinical term. And so then in that hypostasis, it's the divine logos in hypostasis with the cosmos. That's why Romans 8, Colossians 1, mm-hmm. when it says that there's a reconciliation of the whole cosmos now in in through, with, with yeah. respect to God. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> and we're all interconnected in that sense. And so evolution is the mechanism for, for that ultimate reconciliation to happen. And so then Moretz, in his dissertation, argues, I mean, he goes into a little bit of a tangent with respect to the Genesis story and he says it's curious that the hebrew word yetzar in genesis 2 7 when it says man was formed from the dust of the earth or the ground yetzar actually is always associated with um when you do a word study um a thing that uh molds over time so like like when a potter is with its clay and forming a vase the word uses yet or like you know you know a seed like some some i think it's in isaiah like when it says a seed sprouts or forms into like a plant 
or like like in the psalm that says you know you formed my you formed me in the depths of the earth that poetic language it's all that word yetzar is used and we know there's an evolutionary process from one thing to the next is there is that a um, difference between that and the word nit do you know in the in hebrew i'm not no like, i'm not particularly get, get me in my mother's womb type of concept it, but it's in it's in that passage though it could be that it could be that word yeah. but the underlying hebrew word is communicating you were you were this initially and then you become this but then it's not it's not like a it's not like a switch like you you were this and then instantly or that it's it it becomes this so the dust of the earth becomes a living soul and he's saying look it's just a generic statement that it's a reminder that you know god formed man yet saw and then there's this language of placing him so then it's describing man as being part of the creation and then he quotes mm -hmm. patristic writers that say well like augustine actually says this there's a potency in creation to generate um in in evolution but, speak it's it's this like what we call speciation well, and and you know yeah. yeah i mean it's the natural drive to reproduce but the mm. reproduction is to make more of oneself but it's it's to create more of your kind right mm -hmm. creating more of your kind is to say that you you need to fill and um fulfill your purpose i guess as well yeah in mm -hmm. the world i will right, so you're back you're back to mm -hmm. all right so man is placed in a place yeah. and given a task um yeah then and and so then yeah then i go down the high priest language uh Heiser's work goes into the whole mount you have mountain language garden of eden is is described as god's holy mountain then you have that peculiar rebellion in genesis 3 then the kash figure he goes down the trajectory it's this shining entity not like a like some sort of serpent i mean it, it the word is serpent but as an adjective it's the quality of it is some other thing mm -hmm. he connects it to isaiah 14 and sequel 28 those passages and then you have a in other words when, I, when i'm looking at all this stuff and and the stuff that heiser brings out in light of the scholarship I can't help but see that humans are basically in the firing in it they are in the they're in the way <laughs> so there so you have god creation his council I think of it like odin thor and loki loki <laughs> is that is that the cash figure and then earth <laughs> is this this obscure place that has nothing associated with ask asgard right is it asgard is yeah, that, is, yeah right yeah right and but Loki decides to do what he does in Avengers. For some reason, Earth, Earth yeah. is so insignificant, but he just comes and does what he does, right? He's the, he's the chaos figure, yeah. Yeah, and um, so we are in the we are in the crossfire, and then the and then the the amazing thing is this is the gospel coming in. But the amazing thing about the gospel is, even though we're in the crossfire, just like Odin later on in the Marvel movies, when you have Odin coming to Earth and telling Thor, "Hey, look, let's let's actually marry Earth and Asgard together," it's like that's exactly the, the Bible story. You have God, who's and Psalm eight says this: "What is man that you take notice of him?" And then Hebrews two quotes that Psalm and saying, "Yeah, well, then Jesus decided to become lower than than divine in order to then cause that theosis thing," and it's like. Wow, we're all, you know, the Adam and Eve scenario is nothing but we're just servants before our creator. But little did they know, and little do we know, even in the Genesis narrative, that the ultimate decision God actually has is technically like Odin's perspective, like let's marry, have a marriage of these two realms. And um, even though there's the drama in between, um, and so, yeah, I can't help but think of coming to the creation context. I can't help but think of humans with a more or less large population because Genesis 4 makes a lot of sense in light of that, like Cain building a city, you know, there's a mark on his forehead. 
um, because, ooh, you know, what what if they find me? And um, so, so I, yeah. I I really like the the big ideas and the big concept, yeah. and I I I also subscribe to sort of the the temple framework and so forth, and mm -hmm. this this big idea of the cosmos and God's creation. Um, but to ground that into um, something about uh, so what what's the original function? So if if man is kind of in the way because he's he's really thwarting that plan, and only through Christ can we now find that we're. Well, I wouldn't say whole. he's in the way in a negative what? way. I, okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't right. say. Yeah, right. I'm 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 just saying, just like, just like in that analogy of Thor, Loki, and Odin. Earth is just getting along, doing its thing, <laughs> and then the bully comes and then starts, to, you know, messing around with it a little bit. Like it's sort of like that, um, you know. It's it's sort of like there's a little bit of an innocence involved, and then because there's an innocence involved, let's come and let's come and uh, corrupt it. Yeah, you know. And that and that shows real. I mean, if you think about it, that that predatory engagement to try and corrupt something that's innocent—that's genuine evil in that sense. And um, yeah, and uh, and then and then suddenly it it seems to then because of what happens, then according to the biblical story, it seems to then only funnel and focal focus, focus itself in on just happening here. Like the whole battle itself happens to just be then here, according to the biblical narrative. Um, so, so the yeah. the mm. in the garden in this case, it, does that represent to you an the ideal? Like, like um, this is what God would have wanted the world to become. This was His original plan for making the world and sculpting the world, even though the rest of the world is in pseudo chaos where like has been mm, evolved yeah. over time and there are these natural chaotic factors which which create this best world possible under those conditions mm -hmm. then you have you have man the focal the, something that has come out of his creation that's going to have a the capacity to have a an actual personal relationship with his creator mm -hmm. uh and then okay here's the opportunity to have that personal relationship um but god being a sovereign and perfect god has certain expectations of that mm -hmm. that perfect relationship but really because yeah. of our origins all right and 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 having come from the world in a sense really incapable of achieving that type of perfection in order for us to to touch the creator in a way um, Bingo. and and adam exactly. and and, yeah. and and satan is is further corrupting that i guess you could say uh, mm -hmm. or in, in, in specifically um, um, bringing that moment to light that, okay, you, you, seems, you are not, exactly. you are not capable. Actually, you're not capable of not sinning, really. I mean, yes. Um, that, and so now a, you, you, will yeah. need a, you will need a savior. I mean, Christ will have to come and, like you said, become into union in order to actually purify uh, this world. And But you see, words like purify, I'm thinking... There's nothing really wrong. Okay. What what, yeah. makes, what what I I would use the word purify, but I'm thinking more onto, ontological purification rather than there's something yeah, dirty no, and I, wrong. Yes, like, I agree. Yeah. Like ont ontological in the sense Jesus I mean, when Moses says, Can I see your face and, and be satisfied? God's like, No. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I go along with thinkers like Leibniz who came up with the best of all possible worlds because he's mm -hmm. he was wrestling mm -hmm. with this God doesn't create in time. It's just this this reality as we know it is the best of all possible worlds. It's not because he's flipping a coin wondering, oh, that will work or that will work. It's rather yeah. it's just this emergence that just happens to be, you know. As in order to, in order to achieve this eventual goal, this is this is the only way that you can do it. It's through this process. Well if well, if if God decides to create, he, it, it it just is. Yeah. This thing we call reality just is, it just emerges. I find it quite curious that during the Planck Epoch <laughs> of the Big Bang, you know, that hyperinflation, and it just is, right? We see this in cosmology. We don't know what's happening when T is zero, but at, 
you know, mm -hmm. tens to minus 36 seconds, like at least in that time framework. It's just that alone is remarkable. So then Leibniz made the point, ah, but he's omni. He has these omni characteristics. He can't create another omni being because to be omni, to, to be perfect means to be omni. Only God's perfect ontologically. So how can you create another Yahweh? Notice create Yahweh because I thought Yahweh yeah. was eternal. So you can't yeah. create an eternal. Right. So by definition, if it's created and it just emerges, it's less than him. So therefore, chaos, comp, chaos struggle. Genesis 1 gets into that formless void, empty, but God is trying to order it. And so by the time you reach Revelation 21, now that so that so this is again the gospel, the, what God had in plan all along, as Paul says in Corinthians and elsewhere. Um, and he says, even before the foundation of the world, he had this plan to then where we where there is this philosophical conundrum of he can't create it like himself, but he wants it to be on par with him. So he joins his nature to then cause that, that glorification. So that then we can see his face, as Revelation 22 says, we will beheld his face. And, and, and then I'm noticing in between the two extremes, hence Satan or the Loki figure being jealous, just as Loki wanted to be on Odin's throne. Mm -hmm. As you see, he tries to imitate that. Satan wants to do that. But, but as Hebrews 2 says, God didn't put the coming world under the control of angels. And, it, and, he, and literally the author says, he didn't come to help the angels. And so in that yeah, weird, right. around that verse, it says, but he came to help Abraham's descendants. In what way? By becoming ontologically them and transforming them. So I find it curious that if you have a hierarchy, so God, the angels, and then humans, God descends down, Carmen Christie, Philippians 2, below the angels and then puts us up to his level and now the only creature for the first time ever in history i guess like in the new creation will be you and me who will behold the trinity in its all its glory um and we'll be and the angels will be or other creatures will be subject under that like that's the big picture that kind of blew my mind and then evolution as a mechanism or just just the just the the ontological function of the universe as a whole, just the laws of nature as a, as a general whole that bring, and evolution is part of that function biologically. But that that whole thing is is purposely designed to be that way in order for that mechanism to happen the way it does in Jesus. Um, and then obviously that goes down other trajectories that I've thought about, like what about E.T., you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, is you know uh, like if they're, ET they're exists, all around us right now, right? <laughs> I keep getting told every day now that they're just everywhere. Right. Like I know Hugh Ross says there's no ET life anywhere, according to his musings in astronomy, and uh, you know the laws of nature doesn't really. And that, but that, that's again, we don't really know. But I can also yeah, I, I don't, for ET. Yeah, I don't really care for that. the scientific arguments against it. Yeah. I, you know, that's sort of like, uh, I'm, I, yeah, I'm just not convinced mm -hmm. by that. Um, and I don't have a problem if there is, and I don't have a problem if there isn't. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, every event that we see young Earth creationists and older creationists wrestle with with respect to natural history, mm -hmm. notice, notice that the young Earth creationists. This, this this is what communicates to me how empty their concordism or their theology is. Yeah. Putting aside the science stuff, I'm thinking more big picture stuff like Heiser's work in this sense. Their perspective is Genesis 3, fall. We As Ken Ham says, we introduce yeah. cancer into the fossil record and blah, 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 deaths. And then yeah, we're, we're the responsible for absolutely transforming this world in every every aspect. And then the, the God of this universe has an OCD to try and fix our slip up with yeah, an apple. Yeah. <laughs> yep. In Jesus. To then do what? Like what? 
I mean, it, you know, this epic drama happens to be a very human-centered thing in their model. But if I approach it from the way I've approached it, we are technically nobodies, just as the Psalms say, Psalm 8 and so on. And even Job is full of that. Mm-hmm. It, Job's predicament is because of a discussion upstairs. He's he's nothing. He's worthless. And he understands that himself. Um, I mean, worthless in the sense of when you real like Sagan's pale yeah. blue dot, like that perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and so therefore, if there's vast ages of time taking place, not just 6,000 years, but a long period of time, and then you're seeing the drama in the biblical story as not being human centered, but, but, and, and again, using Heiser's work, a more divine drama of the gods and God. And humans are just, again, in the crossfire the whole time. But God, again, showing like love towards this particular creature, which is the human, um, and bringing about, like nurturing them out because they slip up because guess what? They're being inspired by the demonic, I, I suppose you could say that the demonic ideas of these other gods. Like, and then when Jesus comes on the scene, again, that very nurturing attitude, like you can see him, God in the flesh, sort of like a father figure working with it. Like that to me just blows my mind that all of this stuff is vitally missing. You, you won't see this in, in the Creation Museum or Ken Ham's Ark Encounter. And, uh, like, for example, Heiser will say, and the Second Temple scholars will say, there's actually three falls, not one. Genesis 3 mm-hmm. is your first one. Genesis 6 is fall number two. Genesis 11 is fall number three. Abraham. Because Abraham is the, is, you know, God going, okay, I'm going <laughs> to yeah, have right. dispersed the humans, you know. And then Acts 2 is a reversal of that Babel dispersion because all the nations come back, hear the message. Like, where do you see this in Younger's literature? You you won't find it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think this, I, it, you're reminding me so much of what I love about some of my own heritage in terms of the type of preaching I've heard growing up because I grew up in the tradition of what's called biblical theology. And so mm-hmm. that would be... Uh, well, that's Gregory Beale. He's a biblical theology oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. person, right? So it's it's yeah. seeing the strands of of the plan right through everything, and so mm-hmm. it, it, the preaching must include. It's it's not simply here's this passage. What does it mean to me today, right now? It's here's this passage, but it has to be connected to the whole trajectory of the scriptures and what what is the mm-hmm. entire message, and. Um, you know, sometimes that, that boils down to you like, okay, well, you know, Christ, salvation, this, but but it's so much bigger than that. Anyone who can bring in these types of concepts and show how we fit into the world, yeah, it's so much more awe inspiring. And like you're saying, well, you know, what is, you know, what is Job? He's nothing, but then we're nothing. But isn't isn't it even more amazing that we could be part of a of a universe with 27 septillion stars Mm -hmm. uh and yet uh christ has come to fulfill this this mission of accomplishing the mission of of god's creation that's it with us then we're nothing and yet incredibly special at the same time hence the end of romans 8 what can separate us from god's love can this 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 in creation you know because of exactly the way you describe it that's that's paul in his words same, yeah, same thing. and and yeah. and you're right. I mean, the young Earth view is it's so it, it's stifling in a way that it's it's almost like, well, what's the purpose of the rest of the universe? Just to <laughs> yes. have, just just to be able to say to to Abraham, your your sons will be greater than the number of stars. You know, like that's why I made all those stars, so we could have that line later on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, this the vastness, both in length of time and in actual volume of space you know um make it is something that is it is so far beyond us uh and yet is is incredible in terms of our place in that same time so we're, we're not at the center of that but we're at the center of it at the same time yeah yeah 
that's that's what's so amazing. Like you you have God, you have that filter um, as ancient Jews in that second term period, even up until say Islam. Islam had a proto Islam had this concept of Allah needing a veil, a hijab, to veil him before creation because um, if he if that veil was removed, all the creation would melt away. Again, mm. you have to think ontologically and. And so I actually engage with Muslims saying, ah, who's that veil? Uh, that veil can't be a creative thing. It has to be on par with Allah in order to maintain mm, his glory, mm -hmm. right? So, th so the uh, ancient Jews call this the two powers in heaven. This is the, this is the proto-Trinitarian theology coming in, where you have invisible Yahweh, but visible Yahweh, and it's always that, that visible Yahweh figure that, f that filters the, f the invisible Yahweh throughout the Old Testament. He's known as the angel of the Lord. He, you know, he, he appears and then disappears. Um, and then the New Testament authors are like, it's Jesus. Um, you know. Uh, so how do you respond? Yeah. yeah, so now I'm asking the questions because I'm interested. No, I'm, um, I, so I, I, I like this as well, to be honest. <laughs> Even though I'm meant to be interviewing you, I like, I like <laughs> no, a no, professional this is like you to ask me. That's really cool. Yeah. So how would you answer the question which I or the criticism I just saw? I think it was on um, Institute for Creation Research had an article about John Walt. Actually, Answers in Genesis and um, Institute for Creation Research both came out with basically hit pieces on John Walton just recently, last week. Years after those books of years I'm, after those I'll books have come out, they have yeah. come out with these like, you know, here's why John Walton's wrong. Okay. And you know, one one of their big things is they like to say that this can't be true because um, you know, your, your average person isn't ever gonna be able to understand all this ancient Near East literature. And so therefore mm -hmm. it's never gonna be able to understand this big picture. And like, like everything you just went through in terms of talking about the world in a way that's very different than talking about just the physical substance and what's happening, but the overarching picture of history and what, what's really happening in the universe. Right? Um, they won't be able to get that from, from the, because it's all high academic stuff, mm -hmm. right? So how can we bridge bringing a, 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 this bigger story and making that real to people without it sounding like it's, it's something that, uh, right, I gotta, I gotta get out my logo software and uh, spend three years of introspection yeah. on it for me to arrive at this yeah. particular point. I struggle with this myself in terms of explaining like, it, they, they have a great advantage mm. in the sense that, okay, I can give you X, Y, and Z, right? You got this first and this, and you have to believe this and this. This all makes sense. And then you just say, well, everyone will already believe this before. So why change? Well, that's I've, easy. Well, I, I'll, I'll show you um, how I've asked, I've asked the same question myself. In other words, I've asked it for the sake of how how do I bridge this to people who don't know? Basically, uh, so again, I and I and I've online and people, you know, the Sentinel audience have seen this. Actually, actually I, I uploaded a a, <laughs> a a video called "The So-Called Persecuity of Scripture." When I engage with a young Earth creationist, off the cuff engagement, and in that engagement, I just gave an off the cuff example like Ezekiel one, the wheels with the eyes, and so on. Um, what what is that about? And then he had this knee jerk reaction. So I so I explained it to him that it was the it was the zodiac. It was a Babylonian zodiac, and basically in Babylonian astro uh, astrology, geocentrism. So the Babylonian map of the world is that circle with the waters mm -hmm. around it, and if the Earth is in the center, um, the the constellations, uh, well, they notice that constellations move east to west. You know, this night nice sky moves east to west. So that reminds me of something. Oh, yeah, a wheel. Wheels rotate. So that means there's all these objects fixed on the wheel. And um, the, the Hebrew word for star can actually be translated eye. I mean, oh, well, when it says eyes of the wheel or the eyes covering the, the creature's bodies, you can actually translate that as star also in the Babylon language. So that means the stars of the wheel rotate. And notice the language in the Ezekiel. Everything's moving in sync. The wheels move and the creatures move and all that. 
So that so in other words, it's a ba- Babylonian zodiacal cycles of time. Ezekiel is writing for that audience. You won't find Babylonian, you know, zodiac language in Ezekiel one in Nehemiah, or Ezra, or even Isaiah. It's Ezekiel. You will see a hint yeah. of this actually in Daniel. In Daniel seven, it says because Daniel's in Babylon, that you know the ancient of days comes down and the wheels were in motion. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a glimpse of that. But it's unique to Ezekiel. Now, you won't know about that context unless you do Ugaritic engineering and literature studies right. and icono- iconographic depictions of that stuff. Um, but somebody's going to respond. They're going to say, but, okay, that's, that's great. Yep. I, yep. I learned this new tidbit, which now got me a, a little more advanced understanding of this particular piece of scripture. A little bit more advanced, but it, but, yes. but it didn't it didn't like fundamentally alter one of my core convictions, like like an essential of the faith. That it doesn't. I think anybody ought to be able to come up with the essentials and, just by glancing at the scripture. And that's part of that's part of my answer, or that's part of when I was wrestling with this in, in wrestling it again in the sense of it didn't threaten me. It, it rather it. I was wrestling with how do I communicate this to someone who obviously won't know about that. So yeah, I actually okay, I tested, see, yeah. yeah. So I actually tested it one day at a Bible study, and I, how ironic! The reason why I tested it because we we're going through Ezekiel. All right, all right, group. We're at the first chapter. Let's do it. <laughs> By the way, this is 2016 ish, 2017, and I was I was obviously eating all this scholarly stuff up. And going, oh, I know what's going on here. So, you know, no one got it. Everyone was thinking, like like the <laughs> early church, by the way. You know, the early church, the patristics thought that the four faces was the Gospels. Yeah. Right. Like Matthew fits maybe the human face or something. And exactly that allegorical, you know, hermeneutic. Yeah. And then I went, you know what? I'm just, you know, I was acting, I was pretending like I didn't know, but I was sort of giving a hint that I some, I some, I read it somewhere. That is it possible that it could be the zodiac? Because look at a lot of this imagery; it fits, you know. And then everyone's like a light bulb moment instantly was like, "Oh yeah, is that possible?" And then, like in Revelation twelve, you know, yeah. I saw in the heavens. The woman clothed with the sun. That again, astrological imagery of Virgo. So, but then there was some in the in the room that freaked out a little bit because it felt a bit too natural or too primitive mm-hmm. or too. Well, that's no different to astrology. Then, I I need this to be a special text because it's divinely inspired and it's God and God has no association with the stuff. And you see, that was the next reaction they were having. And I'm saying, yeah, no, don't worry. Yeah. Right. Also, Ezekiel you didn't saying, know. well, I've, Ezekiel saying Yahweh is the God of the cycles of time, not Marduk. That's what Ezekiel is saying to his audience. Um, he can use ancient Near Eastern imagery like cloud ride language, which was associated with Baal. No, Yahweh is a true cloud rider. Then Jesus uses cloud rider language in the New Testament to say he's God. Um, like that's, yeah, that's, that's how I approach this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, and 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 also just the fact mm-hmm. that that language does sound weird to us, even when explained, it might sound strange. Like why why use mm-hmm. that? Okay, I I maybe intellectually understand that, but if you if you try to understand that individuals living at that time, living in that culture, but also just I mean, you would have been aware of the stars. It's kind of like people who don't who live in cities exactly. today who don't know anything about, you know, go to the Grand Canyon and have no idea what to expect from that. Mm-hmm. Um, can I can I also that, that, show you? Yeah. No, no. Finish your point. Yeah. No, no. I'm done. Go ahead. I want to show you as a conclusion to my journey in that sense. That was so. So, so this is this is the build up to when I, now I'm completely comfortable to see a scriptural mandate for that question. Where? Okay. Can I see in the New Testament a hint where percept these type of perceptions that that at first seem obscure purely because of lack of knowledge of the context 
can I? Does that phenomenon happen in the New Testament? And have the and if it does, who engage with it and engage with it openly? So, you know how sermons get at the whole. You know, Peter didn't understand Jesus. He was so ignorant of because when Jesus says, "I'll go, I'll go die," and Peter's like, "No." Right, yeah. And like didn't Peter know his old testament? Like, you know, Messiah's prophesied to die and so on. Right. Why, Jesus, why didn't he read those signs? Should have been obvious. Right. right. So Paul actually says this, and this just this for me was fun suddenly I was tracking, I was just like, Yeah. It it makes sense the way it does. And I'm using this as an analogy to answer the question that you're proposing. So I'll share my screen. Uh, here's Logos. Um, in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, he says, well, 7, he says, we speak about God's wisdom in a hidden secret. Now he's talking about salvation and, and the plan of salvation. So he destined this before the world began, right? There's this peculiar verse, and scholars like Walter and Heiser will say that this rulers of the world phrase is actually to do with the divine rulers like Satan. So they didn't understand this this uh, plan because if they did understand it, they would not have killed Jesus. Hmm. So, and then in Ephesians three, he says that he's become a prisoner for Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, and you know he's given this responsibility and all that. And then he goes, he repeats the same secret language: how the secret was made known to me through a revelation, right? And then look at how he describes it. In previous generations was not made known to human beings as it has now been revealed. Mm. So it's mm. like it's like hang on. So the Old Testament had this entire plan that now culminates in Jesus, but no one saw it because guess what? God, if 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 you saw Casino Royale with the Daniel Craig Casino Royale, you know how Vespa betrays him because he tells her that he now knows the tell of um his opponent in the poker game. Sorry, don't know that movie. No? Okay, okay, I, know, okay. I know of the movie, well, but I don't know it. He, he doesn't, so God, in other words, doesn't trust even the even the angels. Uh, I'll quickly show you where that's said. Like in Job 15, uh, you have this language of, if God doesn't trust his holy ones, because the heavens mm -hmm. are not pure. And like uh, Peter mentions in second peter one he says that you have this this um you know god having this plan uh, oh sorry it's first peter one is it first peter one yes the prophets prophesied about the salvation blah, blah 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 these are things that even the angels desire to look into and then finally when jesus approaches them after the resurrection He's like, look, you know, how foolish you are, slow you are to believe in everything the prophet said. And then he, he at the end, he says, uh, these are the words that I spoke to you, you know, everything written about me, law, Moses, prophets, and all that had to be fulfilled. And he opened their minds so that they might understand the scriptures. So there's a deliberate veiling mm -hmm. because of, of this ultimate perspective that if they knew, if the plan was known and transparent, Ultimately, the main enemy here is Loki, you know, so that he can't get up with his mischief, mischief stuff. That God worked it in such a way that even he was deceived to bring that plan out. Um, and that just, again, shows not only the sovereignty of him, but, but God's not afraid to genuinely keep hidden certain pa plans and purposes, even, even understandings of whatever passage that might already be there. Uh, but it finally becomes unveiled later on. So then I I bridged it with with the you know with the Great Commission. So Jesus is talking to a, a Middle Eastern audience, saying, "Go into all the world, preach this message." If I was there, I would tell Jesus, "You mean to tell me this Middle Eastern Jewish religion?" that's claiming your God incarnate, that's reconciling the universe, that this will be applicable to some guy in China. 
that speaks a totally different language and context. And sure enough, have you ever seen John 1 1 in the Chinese translation? No. So our translation says, in the beginning is the Logos, the Word, yeah. and the, the Logos is with God. The Chinese, Chinese translation says, in the beginning was the Tao, and the Tao hmm. was with God, and Tao was the God, and the Tao became flesh. Because And so in other words, that revolutionizes the perspective of Tao, because Tao is this impersonal but grounding principle way of reality. Hmm. Yeah, but and, and so in other words, they were sort of like a deistic religion. And then, you know, let me tell you about the Tao. The Tao became flesh, was tangible, was personal, was, you know. Uh, and now I can reveal so, this to you and I can open your minds to the real. Exactly. To the word. And God's, and, and can't God. I can, I can bring this to the rest of the world now. And notice the gospel message regardless of what position you are in with with how much knowledge you have or not there's just an, i started to realize there's just enough knowledge for everyone to be without excuse the romans 120 principle mm -hmm. um it doesn't mean you have to know that ezekiel one is about the zodiac and then you're saved <laughs> right yeah even with that simple reading without that knowledge you can tell yeah the god that ezekiel is describing is sovereign and you know the true god but the finer details that slowly unravel, like in this case with the disciples, oh, now I get it. Uh, you know, now I can see Jesus in Isaiah 53 and stuff like that. Like, and circling, like to circling me, back I, to Genesis, mm, yeah, there's things you can continue to learn. And exactly. You, you're, you can be unveiled. You can have the veil slowly lifted from your eyes over your whole life or maybe so, it never yeah. really is, never it never is completely removed but that's okay and you see this even in israel's history like remember like the song of moses so you have the the wilderness wandering so that there'll be a culling out of that prior generation so there's a new generation going to canaan deuteronomy is nothing but a recounting of everything where moses is giving a sermon to this new generation saying look the day will come and your children will say this is in deuteronomy 32 the other children will say, why do we exist? What's the purpose in this? Notice that they are coming into the world not having a, a first experience of all this the way that generation was having it. Mm -hmm. So if, if you and I were in Ezekiel's day, we would know 100% exactly what Ezekiel is saying because we are in that moment. But that doesn't mean that now that that message may go lost in translation, that now God has failed to you know to keep things in order, or or that that later generation that may not have the original, more accurate understanding, that somehow yeah. now they're just lost. And no, let let it all work out, and it does work out, and we're just being. It's come full circle. In other words, when we do do Ugaric studies, ancient Aryan studies, notice that there's no. Ugaritic religion cropping up again. Notice it's still Old Testament in our modern 21st century. Like we're, we're not mm -hmm. like preaching yeah. the, from the Onuma yeah. Elish, and you know, um, they were all so they, struggling, so they, struggling to answer similar questions about their world. Yeah, um, but those religions answers. are genuinely lost now. Yeah. The, the the religion that's still maintained its 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 cutting edge engagement with but life happens to be the, the biblical account. Um, uh, yeah, I do ascribe to the, the, the actual preservation of the word of God through these many, many generations as one of the evidences that, of the truth of the word. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not into absolute proofs, you know, mathematical sense or something like that, but I think that, that to me is one of the most compelling things about the Christian faith is the... The, the, the truisms uh, have lasted as long as they have, and we can continue to plumb those depths from the past and continue. It, it could just keep coming back up again because it's exploring truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how? Yeah. How do you feel about my explanation with that? Um, so I'm really, mm. I'm, um, I feel really good. I feel. I, I really like it. Okay. Now, 
I can't really pinpoint exactly what's making me feel uncomfortable. So there's, there's a few, <laughs> few still, little things there that's somewhere. Good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, I I think we're on board in terms of this this bigger cosmological picture mm -hmm. of the purpose of creation, the purpose of God's uh, interactions with us and who we are and what our role uh, mm -hmm. is in the world. Um, do you remember? So I, I, you know, I would I would still yeah. have questions about the exact role of sin in terms of changing mm -hmm. us and the Holy Spirit, and you know, there's it, it, the whole bunch of there's a raft of other things that kind of that um, I would say traditional Christianity kind of holds on to as being like these are really critical things that mm -hmm. your ideas I don't think are, are antithetical to those. Uh, but they, but somebody would have questions about them. Like, how mm -hmm. would you fit that in? Yeah. Uh, again, I'll, 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 maybe I'll bridge it with this. Uh, immediately, what came to mind just then was since we've been talking about Marvel a lot. Um, <laughs> in in the Iron Man two, I'm loving that analogy. By the way, I never, yeah. I hadn't really, not a huge Marvel fan, but I do know okay. those particular movies some, and okay. I hadn't really thought about. You know, I'm more of a talent, Terrence Malick, and uh, that right, kind of right. movie story. Even even Tolkien, for example, yeah. drew on this in his Lord of the Rings. You know, he came up with this thing called a U catastrophe, meaning a good catastrophe. Um, so again, in fact, that fits precisely with hmm. what I just shared with Jesus emerging out of nowhere. That's a U catastrophe. Yeah. It's like everyone's just like, oh, like like Frodo, he's about to fail and. They're at the gates of Mordor, which is the image <laughs> yeah. of the gates of the hell, and yeah, and then suddenly it all crumbles. It's like, what? Where did that come from? That's a U catastrophe. So, uh, Tony Stark's moment of U catastrophe in Iron Man Two was he was being poisoned by the very thing keeping him alive. Um, he tells I forgot his name, uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character. You know, mm. I've tried every permutation. And there's nothing. And then he's like, no, you haven't tried everything yet. <laughs> so then he goes and discovers in a very weird way that his father made uh, the, you know, the permutation of a particular element on this map that he drew right. out. And it's like for over, what, 50 years or 70 years has, has been dead but still taking me to school like that, like he, he passes that remark. And he's like, all right, let's get back to work. You know, let's <laughs> synthesize this. And then it becomes that element that heals him and also is a new form of energy. So I take that to be exactly the way you we do science anyway. So uh, is, is geocentrism wrong? Not really. I mean, I can still navigate and survive on the ocean using the geocentric model. But if I'm on the moon, heliocentrism is the only way I could navigate. Yeah. Um, same thing with the with the Bible. Like, okay, like okay, Naaman. Are you familiar with Naaman's story in Second Kings yeah. five? He, well, the, what does he, the, yeah. the, the, the you having the uh, not polio. Um, what is what does he have? Like, like a skin like a skin the disease skin and disease. Yeah. yeah, he gets healed. And he asks Elisha for a very peculiar favor. He says, okay, if you won't accept any gifts from me, can I take something from this place? Can I take dirt mm -hmm. and load my donkey with it and off I go? Now, in the ancient Near Eastern custom, they believe in sacred ground stuff, meaning this is Yahweh's turf. And when I go to my temple, which I still have to do my job, and that has helped the king kneel, they believe that if they were to spray that region with now his belief in Yahweh, that he's not, in other words, he's identifying with Yahweh now, not with the other mm -hmm. God. Yeah, right. So notice then that Naaman has no Bible. <laughs> the dirt is his Bible. That's it. That's all he's going with. He, that means he will have, he will, he will actually go to the grave, not maybe not knowing about Genesis, not knowing about the Exodus. Um, but then Jesus in Luke four brings up the name and story and how ironic 
the reason why he gets kicked out of the synagogue is because in Luke 4, he says, hey, I've just read from Isaiah 61, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, blah, blah. And there was, and then near the end, he brings up the name and story to say, hey, there were people back then, non-Jew, closer to right, God without yeah. scriptures than you. And then the, it's like, how arrogant of you, Jesus, to say that. Kicked him out. <laughs> the thief on the cross. How, how, we don't know yeah. much about his walk and how much he knew. But then there's this acknowledgement somehow. Jesus is Lord. You know, remember me. He didn't ask to be saved. He's just like, acknowledge me when you enter your kingdom. Yeah. And uh, like. Well, that's the, the veil being lifted. God's allowing yeah. his mind to see this bigger realm, the bigger picture of. So even, even though we may have a very rich in at a moment in his, in human history, people having a very rich understanding in this case, this ancient Near Eastern understanding of things and the original author to that original audience and, and their discussion. And then it gets lost in translation, so to speak. But mm -hmm. now we're sort of rediscovering it. But the point is in that dark era of dark in the sense of ignorance, of that original context. Notice that the gospel narrative is still shine like like bright light as you see throughout church history. Yeah, you know the the, the, the history of the growth of the church. This Ref, you know the Reformation is part of that. And, but then, that's that's what's so interesting is that that becomes the only focus. This thing called you know Lu, you know Luther's perceptions of justification and faith alone, and like that becomes like the only thing people discuss. And now, because of now the advent of science, and as you're pointing out with John Ray, now it's like, hang on, okay, we've had enough of conversations on Romans. Let's just yeah. go back to the other books that we haven't discussed. Um, yeah. Well, it, you know, and, and science is great, but it has resulted in our approach and how we look at things through different, I mean, Kenham's right in some ways. We're looking at, with different lenses at things now. Mm -hmm. And we put that filter of science on everything. And even I, as a scientist, I've recognized that it's not about figuring out all of those details all the time. Mm -hmm. Another cool one for you to think about. Okay, I'll give you one more scripture. I'm loving it. Bring them on. <laughs> How did the Magi know to come to look for Jesus? <laughs> even though they say we saw the star in the east. Where, from what context are they coming from? They had no Bible, right? They had the Zoroastrian religion and the Babylonian almanacs and and all that stuff. Now, I believe the star is Jupiter. Um, there's some ancient ancient Eastern scholars that bring that out, hmm. but in hindsight of the Magi, right? Uh, Paul hints at that in Romans 10 when he's talking about spreading the good news, like evangelism. So how how beautiful are those who bring the good news? And not, but not everyone has obeyed the gospel. And he quotes Isaiah and all that, right? And then he's like, "Look, so consequently, faith results from listening, and listening results from through the word of of Christ." So that means. So this goes back to that original question we had. This is something even more serious. What if what if the gospel is not sent, like the actual text is not sent to some tribe? Right. How how do they know then? So then Paul says, so even though he says this in verse 17, in typical Pauline fashion in verse 18, he goes back and asks a rhetorical question. But I mm -hmm. ask, didn't they hear? Certainly they did. <laughs> but hang on, not in the context of the word going out. So the question is, how do they hear it? And then he quotes from Psalm 19 as his as his. Uh, I don't know, as 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 a technicality, I suppose. Like, well, I suppose that the the voice has gone out into all the world, and the you know, yeah, in some way, and that's Psalm nineteen four. Um, now, just to show you in Psalm nineteen four, if if again the the scholars like Heiser and the ancient Near Eastern scholars will say, ah, it says message or voice, but if you actually go into can you see this footnote i brought up yeah yeah 
If you go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, it reads line. Hmm. And the line here is the ecliptic. The line goes out into all the world. The ecliptic is to do with the zodiac. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so by implication, it's, it's a hypothesis. It's not a foolproof hypothesis, but what does the line represent then, the ecliptic? Well, again, Ezekiel 1, the zodiacal cycles of time, the magi with their astrology, deciphering messages from their religion. And is it possible that somehow in their religion, they made a prediction about a certain king that would arise in this Jewish framework? And scholars who um, specialize in Herodian, like Herod the Herodian family, and interestingly enough, they had a lot of connections with the Magi, quite, quite curiously enough, even well before Jesus was born. That's why you have that very natural reading in Matthew that suddenly they just emerge and they're just like, oh, by the way, yeah, uh, we expect this. Yeah. But we don't have the scriptures. You guys have the scriptures. So you have to tell me where he's born. Right. Yeah. So, so that's how I no, wrestled with right. that question that you've asked. Yeah. 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 No, all that's that's all very helpful, and um, mm -hmm. I think that's having those kind of discrete, articulate um, examples is really helpful uh, for people to see. And I and I do see that. I, I mean, all this is what what it does. It takes time. I mean, it how much time do we time. just spend to do that? Right. <laughs> it's yeah. developing those personal relationships and having people who are willing to be able to ask those questions and be able to then respond by listening and carefully mm -hmm. examining it. Um, mm -hmm. And our human inclination is to look for the easy answers. Um, and unfortunately, a bit too much in that particular camp, right? Uh, the ones we yeah. uh, are good friends in that camp. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I so, have. So go back. As, as, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, go back to that Ken Ham, that Answers in Genesis article, like my explanation there in relation to when you asked me that question about, oh, like about summarize again that. what they were trying to say, like are they hesitant for this sort of thing to be mentioned in, in, in Christian circles? Um, yeah, I think, I think yeah. they, they I mean, very simply, they want it to be the plain text that speaks across all ages and they, and, and you shouldn't have to, know anything about the past in order to understand the present message of the scriptures right so but then you, how you would you understand just, ezekiel one well I, that's, I, that's yep yeah how do you like even how, understand how do you understand language at all if you don't understand the context of any word like how in how would they know that the dead sea scrolls has line there instead of voice in psalm 19. you know you're just trying to confuse people <laughs> and uh, just, that's exactly, not an, that's, that's not an important thing. And if 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 that causes you to have any doubt about scriptures, that's really Satan working and functioning there, yeah, but, creating doubt, and therefore you should cast that out and just be content with the fact that you don't fully understand all the scriptures. And then at that point, you can admit that okay, there we just have lost the original intent and we don't understand some things, but we are confident that God has hold forth all the important essential elements of scripture forward to us and we can clearly understand those and it's, everything else is just chaff that kind of can be blown away over time how about that but but this but this stuff actually confirms my faith even more so how could you project to me that this is removing my faith or destroying the people's faith when this actually helps my faith it's i it, it's a reaction that says the more you know the greater chance it is that you're going to abandon but that's and the your faith, because a faith is a faith is yeah. a simple thing, <laughs> and academics are, are have always been known to corrupt, so stay away from them. Yeah, I'm and that, this I'm is being, I'm being sarcastic. No, 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 no. Now, but no, no, I mean, no, no, there, no, there's I truth there. This is this is sort of the this is the gut reaction of it's it's a that it. it yeah. This, this is, is exactly the, the popular. The sort of this thing is the populist approach. This is sort of yeah. like this is what this is what people in the bench pew believe. Mm -hmm. And leaders take and gravitate toward like, okay, well, what do I need to tell them to continue to confirm what they already believe? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I take 
young earth creationist leaders to really be followers of their own followers rather than leaders yeah. uh, and say like, I'm in a position of authority and I have responsibility and I'm going to teach you something more. It, it's more, here's what you already believe and let me just com- continue to feed you information that will confirm your it's beliefs. It's kind of a feedback loop, loop like yeah. that. Yeah, and then, and then and they become so convinced of their own logic at some point that they become insulated from learning anything new. Um, I really don't think that, I, I know some of them do read outside literature, but I don't think Ken Ham sits down and reads, you know, any kind no, of I don't think so. theology no. books at no, all. No, I mean, he, he's too busy writing his own books. And mm. so he's not, he's, he's not interested in incorporating. And I know that he's not, he, he will not converse with anybody who doesn't have the same opinion because he doesn't want to mm. be corrupted by those voices. And I've been told mm. that myself. I, I, but one story I didn't tell is that growing up, when I went to graduate school, I was in a, I was in a internet debate, um, and uh, our pastors were involved in that, and other people, and I was asking questions about the age of the earth, and so the youth pastor was concerned about my, you know, what's going on, like what are these views? Maybe we should get together for dinner and let's let's talk about this. So we. Mm-hmm. We got together for dinner and I had my new wife with me and we sat down and we had dinner and pleasant conversation. And then it was sort of like the table was cleared. He sat at one end of the table. I sat at the other end of the table with my wife and he got his Bible out and he said, are you for me or are you against me? You know, are you for God or are you against God? You know, it was just first I need to confirm that you're actually not working because that, and then he confirmed. Then he proceeded to tell me he really couldn't listen to any of my scientific arguments because those are of the devil. I mean, that's that's Satan speaking through me, even if I'm not part of Satan. Satan's how using me as his uh, uh, corrupting force. And right. so therefore, he couldn't listen to those arguments. Um, and we could only talk about the Bible. Now, that was an important moment for me for a variety, a variety of reasons. I felt super mm-hmm. ill leaving there. But it also made me realize because I think at the time I was thinking scientifically, like I got all these arguments for why the earth is old and you mm-hmm. got nothing, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna crush you. I'm a little bit like some of the people that I've heard recently talk about me in that I was gung ho and I had all the answers. Mm. Um, and that made me realize it isn't about the scientific evidence, right? You know, it, it's really mm. about having answers for why we believe what we believe and what are some of the core hermeneutical issues involved here. Um, mm. Now you've mm. looked at my blog, you know, I talk a lot about science. I still want to, oh, yeah. pro- I want to provide for those who are seekers. I want to provide like, okay, I'm, I'm struggling with like how to understand these topics. I'm going to provide some answers there, but I don't have any illusions that many people will just like, I don't believe this stuff. I'm just going to read the science and then I'm going to change my mind. Mm. Um, that's the, I'm, I'm, I'm like the several steps down the road, you know, mm, before you mm, sort of like, mm. okay, now I'm going to deal with these topics. There's a, there's a super chat came and thanks Matt. He says, um, I think young creations organizations will have to devote more time to arguing flat earthers. Their, their <laughs> rhetoric on compromise will make this inevitable thoughts. Um, yeah, I think, I, but it is connected to, in some way, in a roundabout way, with that article you mentioned about John Walton's work, because John Walton will say, well, yeah, if you go down the ancient Near Eastern route, you do get into ancient Near Eastern cosmology, which is a flat Earth stuff. But then the flat Earthers are taking it like as if that is yeah. the way things are. Um, I th- I think there's a yeah. definitely a growing element of flat Earthers that are being generated within the young earth creationist community because of the types of arguments young earth creationists use. It, it lends themselves to falling down that, I, I'll call it the slippery slope, down to, down to flat earthism. And you, mm. you know it's becoming a concern to young earth creationists because they have put several people, like Answers in Genesis, uh, Faulkner has written several articles and now a small pamphlet about why young earthism is, uh, sorry, flat earthism is wrong. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't they wouldn't try to upset anyone within their camp if they didn't feel like this was a real problem. And now they're mm-hmm. trying to confront mm-hmm. that. And uh, in the chat group, in the chat session, in a uh, live session I was watching the other day, talking about me, and you know what I'm talking about, yeah. uh, a flat earth debate broke out there. 
you know, and it's going to like, really? how, do we can, how, do we can, how do we control this? Because, you know, their arguments are almost the same. And yet we're going to say like, no, you're a fool. But here we are saying everyone else is a fool. Um, hmm. it, it become the, their own arguments become a, a a, an inhid, a hindrance to trying to dispel um, the flat earthism. Mm. Um, so what's okay. So in hindsight of everything we've discussed as well, and also <laughs> I, I appreciate you also asking me like, how have I wrestled with this? And um even though this is, and, and I'm also letting the audience know as well, this is the first time Joel and I even this dialoguing, even though we've dialogued recently and we've been messaging each other through DMs, but... No, we're just uh, figuring out who each other are, yeah. Like, this is, this is in the moment. It's like a kindred spirit sort of thing going on. And, and I suppose you're getting the perspective that I'm <laughs> obviously a guy in Australia tucked away on this planet you're a prof actually a professional you're you know a professor you, you know you're actually doing science and you've also been wrestling with this with, with these data points and a christian so you bumping it to me or me to you and the way we sort of put our cards on the table does this then give you some form of like a relief like an easier <laughs> yoke about about the, the the church moving forward with respect to how Christians engage not only scientifically but theologically. So, in other words, am I or people like me? And trust me, there are. It's not just me. Every like Matthew, for example, he's part of the Sentinel community. There's a, there's a there's a growing more introverted in this type of Christian brotherhood that care about the stuff that I just shared and what you also talk about. Absolutely. Is there hope, in other words, uh, outside the young of the camp that might be the loud voice, but they're not really, they have no foot anyway in the academic realm anyway. Um, yeah, do you, do you feel some form of like a, like a light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, I do. You know, I feel, I feel yeah. actually this conversation has been uh, delightful in so many different ways. Um, I'm yeah, I feel I feel really great that there are others that are are just willing to think about these topics in a very serious mm -hmm. way, and I am seeing that. I mean, ever since the I mean, there's the growth of biologos here in the United States. Um, I also know just because I have a lot of pastor friends, and I have formerly been on a lot of lists where pastors talk and and so forth, and I mm -hmm. have a lot of inside sources within some churches. At denominations that there really is a lot of consternation about young earth creationism but we're still in this stage where um it's it can be a little bit of a a no-win situation if somebody is very forceful against young earth creationism because of what we talked about earlier it, you know their people in their church have been brought up on young earth creationist literature and homeschooling Right. There's, yep. there's, there's, just, there's a large volume of, of information out there that has infiltrated into just the, the, the consciousness of, of a lot of, even if they don't understand it, it's sort of what they expect. Mm. And it puts pastors in a difficult position. I mean, this is, I mean, you see what Ken Ham does. He constantly talks about how pastors that went to seminaries are probably corrupted because he understands mm. that in seminaries they're doing what you're, what you're talking about. They're reading this literature and they are thinking about these things in this type of way. And I know many, many individual individuals in seminaries that uh, are, are deeply thoughtful on this topic and they're teaching pastors this, but then you get into mm. the real world, which is, okay, now I'm a pastor and I, I'm of a, I have a small church and uh, if I start talking about this in this way, I might, you know, fracture this church. And so you just tend to ignore the topic or you try to not mm. talk about it. And that's a, that's a big problem. But what I'm saying is there is a large, there's a large number of individuals out there that aren't heard, mm. um, but they're there. They read this literature, they see it, they hear things like, you know, watch stuff like mm. you're doing. Mm. Um, and I think you're having a, a big influence. I, th I think these types of 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 this type of media 
has a has a really great opportunity to to really move the bar some. Mm -hmm. But it's a long term project. It's not overnight. <laughs> you know that. It's like, and I'm in no rush either way. I because the reason why yeah. I'm not in no rush is I don't have. Um, I'm not making young earth creationism or people like them that are, you know, horse blinder engagement that, that, you know, I make it into an idol. Like I need, I need to convert them out of that or something. My approach is just me doing me and those individuals that you saw in that live stream, let them yeah. do them. And yeah, I, uh, I have, I have so many, I think what they don't understand is, I mean, well, and, and you get this, people see you just live or just what you're right and don't mm -hmm. maybe know you as an individual. But I know a lot of people individually, you know, have lots of personal conversations. And they, and I, I know many, many young earth creationists because I've been mostly uh, members of churches where most people are young earth creationists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not, I don't have a bad relationship with any of them. Right, mm -hmm. I'm on good terms, and we can talk, and we can converse, and same with me. Um, yeah. And and we, mm -hmm. and and I think they've learned a lot from me. And I would say I have converted some, but it's not been like I'm going to convert you. Mm -hmm. It's more mm -hmm. having conversations so and the asking is interesting the questions. Yeah. yeah, and and if yeah. they happen to like change your view somewhat, or just even moderate them a little bit, or even just appreciate that this is complex, right? You know, it's just like all these other topics we've talked about in Sunday school, or whatever. Once you start digging into it, it's like, oh, wow, there's like all these different nuances. Mm -hmm. And when they find out, oh, young earth creationism, oh, there are other nuances and they're not all just crazy um, <laughs> to, to suggest yeah. that there's something, there's some other better truth, actually, to uh, a way of understanding these passages. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a hard road. And right now it's it's such a divided, uh, well, for us, a divided country here along political boundaries and so forth. And it is, it does get wrapped up into, into some of these, um, I don't know, boxes that young earth creationists are in. Mm. And for them to let go of young earth creationism means something more than just changing a, a view of scripture. It, it comes along with a number of other, um, uh, I'll call it baggage along with it, but I'm sure they don't view it that way. Since you've engaged, and, and again, a lot of your blog posts, you're, you're engaging with sort of like an observation response method with, you know, young earth creationist um, situations <laughs> uh, yeah. throughout the history of your blog posts. Uh, Is it a, how would you ultimately, if you were to really iron it down or distill it down to three bullet points or something, if you could, uh, like like maybe your hopes for the Young of Creationist movement, but I'm thinking more the psychology of the whole thing. Like why are they so fixated and ingrained to hold on to this thing and then immediately jump to things like, oh, you're working for the devil because it's not it's not this model. Like uh, it's pretty sums. simple. It's pretty yeah. simple, really. It okay. really is. It is simple. It it's simple because once you attach um, a several important doctrines to the young Earth, right? So you have um, the world is X years old. But what's more important is is that. Uh, it was created recently because that's what scripture says. And we're absolutely convinced of that because Jesus said X, Y, and Z and referred to this. And so we have a few few things here that say that it has to be this way. As soon as you commit to this doctrine will fall if I don't believe X about the age of the earth and you attach those two things together and you're convinced they go together then there is nothing you can do but absolutely fight for it tooth and nail because you are fighting for the soul of of, of Christianity, for the for the foundation of Christianity. I mean, what what is it, what is what does Ken Ham say all the time? I mean, it all begins in Genesis, like every single doctrine comes from Genesis. And if you just let the tiniest little crack develop here, it's gonna go ahead and shatter your entire windshield. Um 
And so that's why they continually pound that idea into all their followers that you, you, you that this is absolutely necessary because every essential doctrine hinges on the appropriate view of, 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 of Genesis one and two. And of course they attach that to an actual physical, you know, length of time. What happens? And, and as, you know, it's, and then when it, when that when that breaks, when somebody realizes that 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 first part is wrong, they do feel like everything else is shattered. Um, if they feel like the two things have to be tied together, because it sounds then that that's all they know is just those two chapters of the Bible. They don't know about the three falls that the second temple yeah. Jew would have told them about. Yeah, and the significance of the Tower of Babel that leads to this thing called the this Deuteronomy thirty two worldview that Heiser talks about this dispersion of the humans under the other gods, then this thing called Israel, then this huge big drama epic leading up onto Jesus and you know everything I but, but but now we're just gonna go right back to what we said before, which is you're you're introducing what sounds like philosophy and you're introducing but things that sound like you know the it's, <laughs> it's in the it's literally just a few more pages after chapter two. It, like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there's so much interesting cosmology in the scripture. It's 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 incredible um, throughout. But that that's too complicated for me. I had to simple simple the yeah you know, simplify the the Bible well, down to you know, down even to the five first two chapters are and, complicated. Uh, Let alone the rest yeah. of the Bible. Even the first two chapters are complicated. Like, um, yeah, and and okay. But, but, so, but you see, like yeah. you know, if somebody but. If, if you're attacking a foundational, what you believe to be a foundational principle, something that is a core belief, um, and, and something like the fall, right? The, the, the origin of sin, that sin exists in this world, and that is the, the reason why we need a savior. And if you're attacking that, then obviously you are of the devil. But I mean, what other option do you have? You, you either are for God or you're against God. And if you are not following the plan, and this is clearly the plan, then you are against God. How and would I? There could be nothing worse than you being milky toast and just like allowing, you know, the devil to, to, to come in the door. You, you got to slam it shut. And that's why I'm a compromiser. That's why you're a compromiser. That's why, that's why compromisers yeah. are the worst because they are the ones that are, they're more lethal to this, you know, the salvation of those who are, are truly those of God versus the atheist, which is an obvious devil, and we can ignore them. Actually, but we don't. I'm, ignore by the them. way, I like to talk about atheists yeah. so that because it makes yeah. a clear distinction: you're either atheist yeah. or you're over here. There's really nothing in between. If you're in between, yeah. you're really in the Netherlands. I mean, you're not the Netherlands, Netherlands, but yeah. the hinterlands. <laughs> the wastelands. Okay, I'm not saying that you're doing this because I know you're role playing, and yeah. I want the audience to to feel this. That notice the projection. You're this. You're that. The devil's doing this. It's. It just. It just. This is giving me. Uh, like a deja vu of those conversations I had all those years ago. Uh, with. <laughs> yeah, like you're doing a good job imitating. You know that where it's just this projection, and I just couldn't. I couldn't. Um, it's not that I couldn't stand it anymore. It's just I, I. It's like why I'm just literally wasting my time. You, lit, and I actually told one of them. I said, "Look, you do you. I'll do me." And I and I said it in a. And I know it was an arrogant way of saying it, but how how else am I to describe it? I'll make progress. You won't. Like. I'll actually yeah. make progress, yeah. whether it's, it doesn't have to be big progress, but the point is I'll make progress in life. You will just be stuck in this horse blinder mode. And, you know, and the sad truth is like five, six years later, when I bump into those people again and I ask them, you know, what, what, what have you done with your life? And it's so sad. Like those who really allowed this to dictate their life, their education, their whatever. Mm -hmm. They're just it's still in that stagnant where they, they haven't really progressed in education. They don't really have good jobs. That 
you know it's it's uh, a culture of protectionism where you build a fort around yourself and in a part of it is and this goes all the way back to revelation eschatology and so forth a, a lot of these individuals are in the mode of i'm just hunkering down in this world and i just i just want to survive until i get to that afterlife right th th there's nothing in this world there's I nothing see. this world is not going anywhere right it's not actually progressing like all the things we talked about sort of evolving and God's working in this world. No, this world is just a, it's a temporary space and it's been ruined, right? And it's decaying, right? Genetic entropy, there's all these different concepts in young earth creationism where the world is essentially falling apart. And mm. so there's a, a, there's a negative view of the future and I just wanna protect what I have. And then I'm gonna put this little moat around my kids as well. And as long as you believe these things, and so anytime you're trying to expand your your ideas and try to understand the world and maybe and like try to make the world a better well. place yeah. or or yeah. try to protect the environment because mm. I mean the environment's gonna be gone anyway, you're just allowing yourself to do work that's not the real work, which is just protecting yourself so you can go to heaven. And that right? is I mean, so the real, sad the real work is just is just maintaining your faith, not cultivating and creating in this world and actually governing and sculpting the world like mm -hmm. like we've been given the task to do that God has given us. Now we may do it imperfectly, but I think we still have the role of shaping this this world. Um and but they don't want to tend the garden. They just want to put a put a fence around it and just hope it survives long enough that they can jump off this ship. So they're mentally prisoners to an 1800s George McCready Price theory. <laughs> and yeah. their lives are just ruined because of it. They don't even, and, and the sad thing is they don't even know it. It's, it's you know, it's no different yeah. to Hindu culture. Um, just, just a quick question. Is my internet lagging? Like, am I breaking up? Or was this smooth? You, there was once or twice where I saw you go black screen, but you came right back, but your voice has okay. been fine. Okay, so in, in in Hinduism, you know the famous karma stuff, but uh, a lot of Westerners don't actually know that uh, karma is um, not the arbitrariness that we tend to perceive it as. Like, mm -hmm. like in reincarnation, like oh, you you might come back as a bug or something. In classical Hinduism, if you were say a a, a woman abused by your husband or something in the next life that's karma karma is you you become you are that woman and then you have to receive what you gave but here's a subtle <laughs> uh, i guess paradox well if you come back in the next life receiving what you gave that means there has to be someone giving to, you that right so you're perpetuating the need for another life. But then the next yeah. life after that, that person doing that to you will then have to receive that karma. And on it goes. The yeah. so sin is Back endless. And, yeah. and there can be no progress, really. No. And well Well, depending well, on your definition of progress, but Well, the progress is this is where yoga comes in. And and concepts like yoga, because yoga is this you want to escape out. Mm. So yoga is basically suicide. Yoga is you you yoke yourself to the point that you you literally die and you you slump over and you're you're on that yoke. So so um, nirvana is hence that the concept of that is is to be blown out like a candle that's just blown out. Um, so and then once you do that, oh, then you've reset the cycle because you've done something very selfless. Um, but 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 the reason why I brought that up is if you were to go and help a person, say on the side of the street that uh, has no money for food, so much so that they amputate themselves and eat their limbs, you know, just to stay alive. So you go and help them. They will tell you, "This is my karma. Don't help me. I I need to go through this," and that's so sad because it's like, yeah. You know, I I feel like smacking them across the face. Wake up! Stop yeah. being enslaved to this horrible, just this useless ideology. Uh, and it's no different to that. It's like they like it, like what you just said. That they feel like they're just lurkers in a reality that they just happen to be born in, 
yeah. as long as my relationship to God is okay, that's all I care about. And if I'm a nobody, that doesn't matter. And then you die. It's like, that's so sad. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess the other aspect of it is kind of an anti-intellectualism. It's, it's, it is mm -hmm. a fear of greater knowledge because somehow greater knowledge is going to, it, it, it can't lead you to anything better. It can only make you question things. And it's better just not to question. It's better to just follow. Hmm. Um, and My friend Tui. It, I think, I think is... going back to what you said earlier is, is mm -hmm. there are different sort of layers. You know, some people will never see much depth, all right, in, in terms of their Christian walk. But they, that they have enough that they, that they can be saved. And maybe they don't, they don't really think deeply about anything in this world, but at least they have that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's room for others who really want to explore God's world. And I think that's part of bringing glory to God. I mean, part of bringing glory to God is actually experiencing, understanding, and revealing his creation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, God can make all these things, but they can't, they reflect his, his, his nature, they reflect who he is, mm -hmm. but they can't really give him glory and they can't really give him greater appreciation like mm -hmm. we can. And, and by exploring creation, I think we are actually glorifying God. Uh, and so fearing creation, fearing the world around us and fearing actually gaining any more knowledge about it, I think, I think it's shrinking away. It's not really, I'll say it's not using your gifts Right, it's taking mm -hmm. your talent and basically saying, "Okay, well, I'm going to preserve this talent until you return," instead of investing it and saying, "I've I've done something more with what you gave me." You know, you've you've verbatim. Um, by the way, before I hey, get that to I that, came up with that myself. I didn't copy that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to show you verbatim. <laughs> your echo of of uh an ancient text that you might be going oh, oh the fact okay. that you've come up with that it just shows it, just, it, just it shows the idea is not wrong because it, if you come up with it independently it's like yeah yeah um but to we look for quickly, in science <laughs> Tui just said uh, uh so to is a mate from in the sentinel group he he's of the lutheran um strand and he's a very good thinker uh, he agrees with you and I and all of the stuff. And so it's like, yeah, it really is a soci sociological ghetto, hunkered down and in, in on itself. In many ways, there are even shibboleths and special use of language vocab that identifies you as part of the in-group. Yeah, definitely. And that, in a nutshell, that's describing everything you're trying to describe as well. Um, I'm very wordy. That was very concise. Yeah, yeah. He, that's that's his gift. He, I, I envy his... <laughs> <laughs> <I> like it. <laughs> but here's a second temple text called the wisdom of Sirach. Mm -hmm. And it's in the Septuagint and check it out. Chapter 38 verbatim says what you just said. So honor the physician or doctor for his service with honors for the Lord created him also. Healing is from the most high and he will receive a gift from the king as the skill and they translate a skill here, but the Greek is, is literally science. So the science of a physician will exalt his head. He will be admired before nobles. The Lord created medicines out of the earth. A prudent man will not be irritated at them. And then this is an example of the Exodus story when mm -hmm. water was made sweet by wood and all that. And again, that word for science. So he gave humans science or skill to be glorified by his marvelous deeds. Um, and so therefore, um, and so by them, he attended to and removed his pain. Now, this translation says perfumer, but you could, you could translate this as pharmacist so, or, or a person who makes medicines. Mm -hmm. So we'll make a mixture of these things and he will, and he will never complete his work and peace from him is on the face of the, of the earth. So this complete this work, Again, in other translations, will say it's a never-ending thing. This this thing called medicine, doctors, um, healing people, um, and so therefore, peace, a type of peace, is generated from this skill that is on the face of the earth. So don't be 
So hence, don't be leg- 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 negligent <laughs> in your illness and, you know, uh, yeah. And I find passages like this, that's also part of the deuterocanonical literature and for the, you know, in Orthodox Christianity, they, they use Sirach, but, um, yeah, it's that's like, great. It's like, there's the, there you go. There's a, there's a, a religious text that may not be part of the Protestant canon, but is n- nevertheless, they were still believing in the same God as you and I acknowledging the fact that we need to give honor and glory and praise to in this case, uh, medical science. Um, because in his sovereignty, God has, you know, given that for humans to enjoy. And yeah. Yeah. And I, we should point out that that, uh, that discovery never really ends. I mean, think about what they knew about medical science back then. And, mm-hmm. you know, here we're trying to say, praise God for what medical science knows now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we look back at that as like, whoa. You know, I don't want to be exposed to that medicine, but that was the best they had. And mm-hmm. we've mm-hmm. continually improved upon that. Um, Isn't the whole COVID thing, wasn't that like, what, 20 years in the works or something, the vaccine and the, the, te- the technology behind it and COVID came and then it's like providentially we can now use it. Yeah. 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 I'll give a short pitch for the mRNA vaccine. Yeah, you should get it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Everyone any, here yeah. could have it, but they don't. So I know that's oh, okay. not true everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. There is a shortage here in Australia. Uh, the government is. There's a lot of. It's just bana- It's just bananas here. Um, AstraZeneca was was a big like import, and then. Yeah, and then throwing in the bin because of certain butt clotting and yeah. Anyway, it's all. No one's got their, their stuff together, um, but I am of the mainstream argumentation that you know it's a requirement, uh, and uh, when 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 it's available for me, I'll take it. So glad to hear it. Yeah, but we don't have to go down that. That's kind of a. Definitely a rabbit <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, you don't um, want to get me started on that because I have a lot to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe if you want, you can in some way connect it to, I don't know, God or something. But like, <laughs> I don't know if you've thought of it that way. But yeah, like, like there's obviously the typical, like, you know, where is God in a corona world? and um, But is... For example, okay, is COVID, is there an evolutionary, could you use COVID uh, as an example of evolution to a young creationist? Because obviously it's a big, it's a big topic today. And yeah, I mean, you could ask, you can just ask, um, where do you think the virus came from? You know, the the question is origin. So then you have Mm -hmm. a couple options. You can just say, God created COVID pretty basically very similar to the way it is now. Obviously not exactly the same because we know that it's it's not absolutely a new creation um, mm-hmm. today. Although maybe Hugh Ross believes that because of his sort of immediate change in creation all the time. But um, so if it was created originally, then we get back to the whole all right, young with creations have a perfect world originally. So they're this is the constant problem for them is they have to they almost I, I imagine every day you turn around and you see something, you have to say, like, well, what did that originally do? Because mm-hmm. in their conception of what perfect is, uh, things aren't perfect, right? They're they're all corrupted by sin somehow physical manifestations of the world are somehow corrupted by sin. So they have to imagine there's some other purpose for viruses. And maybe that virus did something else in the past that wasn't so bad. So anyway, I, I've asked those type mm-hmm. of questions. And you get into conversations. It's very easy to get into conversation and figure, oh, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Oh, so where did it come from? OK, well, then maybe, well, maybe it had a different purpose. Well, then when you get to it did have a different purpose, you have to ask, well, so how did it get its new purpose? Like, how did it change? Did God mm-hmm. come in and? 
snap his fingers and like do a new creation to change the virus from having one function to another, like change its genome, give it a new gene and give it a new function? Or did it evolve, right? Did it go from its original state and then have, you know, somehow change its, its, its habits, right? Had to learn how to adapt to the human body or to pangolins or bats. And that required changes. Well, I would say, well, what changes are those? Oh, well, maybe some kind of mutations. Oh, well, you mean like mutations can actually change an organism to make them adapt to living in different organisms? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but well, so how did they mutate? What's a mutation? Is it random? Oh, I don't believe in random. So did God make that mutation occur in that specific place? In other words, is he guiding that thing? So you mean he's mm -hmm. guiding evolution? He's guiding things from being a good purpose to a bad purpose over time? Mm -hmm. um, you see where there's a zillion questions that can that suddenly pop out once you start exploring things. And the more you ask those questions, young Earth creationists end up getting boxed into things like, okay, well, maybe they originally had these genes, but God pre-programmed them with other variation they weren't using. So originally, and they never would have used those genes had Adam not sinned and the world stayed perfect. But as soon as Adam sinned, all of a sudden those new genes were like turned on. Like there's a switch that goes on and says, now you can change into this other thing that was part of my other plan, just in case this other thing didn't work out where mm. uh, Adam was supposed to do this, but he didn't. So I had this backup plan and now these organisms can change into these other types of uh, critters. Um, so that alone gets you to questions of like the mechanisms of how organisms actually adapt uh, over time. And that will get you to natural selection, genetic drift, talking about mutations, where do mutations come from? Is natural selection a process that is guided? Is, is God fully sovereign in control of every step? Is, is, are these, uh, you know, open-ended things? Uh, you know, it's like every question, every major question, you know, about life mm -hmm. can be derived from virtually any particular organism you want to pick out and just start talking about. Um, by the way, the coronavirus has, there's hundreds of versions of coronavirus. There's other ones that have invaded humans in the past mm -hmm. and there's whole families of them. What I find amazing about coronavirus is it's a fairly young family, you know, speaking from a old earth perspective and talk, usually you're talking millions of years for a family of organisms or a type of organism to have evolved. Coronavirus is is maybe only six ten thousand years old, so it actually kind of fits into a, a young Earth creationist model in terms of like all the different variations. That's also amazing because they they infect uh, dozens and dozens of different species. I would say it's it's a growing family, a rapidly growing family that is learning how to adapt to many different organisms on Earth right now, and it's uh, it, that's why it's called an emergent disease. I mean, it's it's emerging and it's only going to yeah, we're going to confront this again in the not too distant future in terms of mm -hmm. another strain. Mm -hmm. So some people might wonder, well, why didn't mm -hmm. it happen in the past? Well, when you have small populations, organisms don't, I mean, viruses don't have a chance to mutate and they don't have a chance to propagate themselves and they very quickly die out in small populations. So once you get to a large population, that's when you can start to maintain a population of viruses, which allows them to continue to evolve. So just, so I just told to, you, if you got me started, yeah. uh, yeah, I start talking fast. No, 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 no. I so I, to be honest, I want I want also clarification from you about this. So, I'm going to use the analogy of say morality here. So imagine a little child, innocent, versus an adult that's been there, done that. Um. So if you're talking about viruses, so. If you go down the young Earth model, are viruses and practically everything else in this ecosystem of survivability, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. and this just the way organisms function, and kind of like what you were met talking to me a moment ago about a particular plant that it is a uh, what is it? It's yeah, like a whole it, parasite that yeah, it's a parasite them. exactly. Now, to use this as a, in a moral sense, so imagine everyone is, is very good, <laughs> innocent, good. They, we, we just exist in our various forms. Well, then the question is, why do you exist in your various forms? Like, obviously, evolution will explain why you are in your various forms because it's, it's part of that morph morphological framework and, you know, with respect to the environment and the genetics. But the point is, 
in the youngest paradigm, it just is. You just a whale is a whale, a horse is a horse, a human is a human, and a virus is a virus, whatever shape it has. And, and everything is in well, complete harmony. Well, you're saying Younger's, you know, would say it is, it is, except that it isn't because in the original creation, they weren't what they are today. Right? Okay. I mean, was so, a horse was a horse a horse? Did the, at the very did God create a horse like exactly like you know a horse? So how, what what would they say would be that original horse? You see, this is what's so confusing. Well, I mean, I think they would say that there was a horse kind of organism that was very similar to today's horses, um, but it wouldn't necessarily have all the features that horses have today. I mean, I like, but let me change the example. Like, okay. what about a, a you have a rabbit? Rabbit has eyes on the side of its head, right? And, and really, the reason you have eyes on the side of your head is so you can see predators coming at you from either direction. Whereas predators have eyes in the front because they're looking forward and they're not concerned about what's coming at them from the side. So if you went back to the original creation, you say, well, like, what was the original rabbit? Well, why would God make the original? Did the original rabbit look like today's rabbits, um, or did it not need to be able to look for predators because there were no predators? Oh, like a scorpion. Um, you know, what's, in other words, there's no function. In other words, every function I could go or I could go feature by feature down an organism, and you could say, well, here's what the, the reason why that function exists is for this. All those functions have to do with the way ecology works and the way organisms are interacting, and almost all of them are something that a young Earth creationist would say, oh, that can't really happen in a perfect world. So therefore, you have functionless organisms in the original creation. They don't. They don't serve. Their features don't serve particular purposes other than just, I guess you could say, they glorify God just by existing. But you can't look at them and study them and say, why are they the way they are? Because it doesn't make sense the way they are. In this so new so world, so though, in this world of death and destruction and, and organisms that have to uh, live and die and reproduce, all the features of an organism can be explained within that particular uh, conceptual framework. So in other words, you, if, if you are that young creationist, you just have to accept that this is the way God did it, no questions asked. Yeah. And then when the, flood, when the, when the fall happened... Something's uh, changed, but it's hard either. to know what, what changed. Because you can't go back and see the original creation. I don't know how much changed, because what did it really look like? I have no way of even predicting. You see, and so this is why I was trying to use that analogy to, for those maybe lost the, the analogy of some morality <laughs> here like like a little yeah. like imagine everyone everyone is a baby everyone are babies <laughs> uh regardless of what you are like a cute baby lion you know they're cute they, they don't mean no harm right no. uh so you have a baby baby everything baby even a baby coronavirus um and and so therefore there's <laughs> they they don't do they don't it's you know it's a perfect creation everything's in harmony there's no death and and but so there can't be new life that way either all yeah. you can do is continue you can only continue in that scenario there really is, there isn't any i don't want to, i don't hate to use the word advancement because i don't necessarily mean becoming more complex or right better but you can't change yeah, that's true. Okay, I, I have a, a super chat here by Jamie Russell. So he was one of those people that followed through with that particular video that you, um, <laughs> yeah. we both saw. So, so, he, yeah. so he's like, okay, interesting. Hey, Jamie, thanks for the super chat. So he goes, interesting question. Is God responsible for everything that occurs? Did mutation or genetic de degradation come by God's hand in a direct sense? And then he, he clarifies by saying, Many parasites are minimizing their makeup to survive. Genes turned off. Then he says, "Why do male mosquitoes use their needle to suck plant juice, but female bit produce bit females' blood available nutrients, which evolved first for them to sap of blood as food? Do sharp bird beaks and talons evolve for carni <laughs> carnival carnivorous use or digging and cutting roots?" Those observations yeah. he made, but yeah, yeah. Well, the answer to, uh, well, I guess collectively, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it depends. Um, so, it, like those features of like, well, so like, I just use bats as an example because mm -hmm. um, I know a little bit more about them. So, do they originally 
uh, eat blood or sugar from plants like fruit eating bats or insects. Um, and then, so the, the, the argument here, I, th I think, is you know, if they're adapted to one thing or made to do one thing, then how, do they, how would they switch to another? Because they're already adapted to that. They're doing really well with that particular uh, combination of characteristics. And so how does, how does one move then to a, a, different, a different form? Um, it also might be suggesting too, if they could eat plants, uh, but like you could use your talons to get plant roots, then maybe that's the original feature in the creation. Like that's God originally said you could eat plants. And so they're using those features to eat plants. And now later they're like, oh wait, I can actually use this to like grab a rabbit as I'm flying by and I could eat that. Uh, instead, and so they switch their their uh, pattern. Um, yeah, I mean that that that's possible, um, but when you really get down into biology and you find out like how adapted uh, features are, uh, that's it's not very realistic that uh, an organism would that all organisms all those adaptions are just for eating plants, and then all of a sudden they just switched over to eating meat. Mm. Um, in in the bad example. Bats can eat fruit, um, but we also know by looking at lots of different bats that some of them have not very long ago switched uh, different food types. And usually that happens when you have two different food, type, food types available and bats adapt to being able to use both resources. And then when one of them becomes more prevalent, they become more adapted to the other food source. And eventually they switch over to only using that particular resource. It's kind of like omnivores, right? We can eat meat or plants and some, some organisms eat only animals. Some organisms eat only plants. Um, omnivores are kind of in between. Uh, and to get from mm -hmm. plants to mm -hmm. animals, you usually go through an omnivore stage. So in, your, in that talk you gave, when you said questions for the church, specifically question three, I think is related to this because you said, I think uh, these questions are brilliant. So you, you said, or you asked, who created the exquisite, exquisitely designed predators and adapted prey after day six? Now, as far yeah, as I can understand. Yeah, it's the combination between the two. It's, it's not just that something has amazing adaptions to being a predator, but the preys are amazingly adapted to trying to avoid the predator as well. So that's that's called mm. when you're co-evolving. The two things have to interact with each other and they're both evolving characteristics to try to be the best at what each one is doing. One's avoiding mm -hmm. and one's trying to capture. Mm -hmm. um, now, as far as I know, you know, Nathaniel Jensen and that lot are arguing that there's already inbuilt, in other words, God wasn't surprised that this was gonna happen because he's omniscient. So yeah. he's for some reason inbuilt like a programmer, the programming characteristics that will only activate when necessary once the fall happens. It's like a like a fail, fail safe sort of mechanism to go, oh, now it's happened. Somehow it knew to yeah. unlock Pandora's box and now now Skynet like, has has gone sentient. Like, like there there wasn't there wasn't any <laughs> desert before the fall, and then all of a sudden some areas started to dry up because there wasn't as much rain, and all of a sudden the organisms had to either die or adapt to that. And fortunately, they had these genes that could be suddenly expressed and turned on that would give them features that would allow them to live in that new environment. And so, in essence, how is that different to? How is that not rapid evolution, as you're as you're suggesting? But but is that I, even know, possible will... from a law from the from a natural law perspective? Is that even possible? Is because I don't see that to be possible um, unless you're talking about vast periods of time and well, the genetics working. Okay, there's there's like, two parts there that okay. possible would be okay. One is organisms don't well. In evolution theory, organisms don't necessarily know what's going to happen to them in the future. So they're not right. pre-programming themselves for the future. However, there are organisms that say the environment, like bacteria, that when the environment dries down, they suddenly turn on a bunch of genes and they become encapsulated so they can preserve themselves. Right. So they have the pre-programming to do something they're not doing right now. On the other hand, they've also developed that programming over a long period of time that allows them to do all these different things in a lifetime. Just like you and I turn on certain genes when we were a baby. Later on, we're going to turn different genes on later in our life. They're programmed to come on at different stages. 
Um, but but is that and, programming already there by God at the start of creation, as the yeah, so, creation is proposed? Is that an actual thing in re in reality, or is, or do like do, do biologists agree with that pro proposition that Gene's like getting at? No, I, it, it, the question is how much pre-programming could you even have? Your genome may be limited in terms of information space. Okay. And also, how would you protect that pre-programming? So the pre-programming presumably is a bunch of genes that maybe you're not utilizing now that you're going to use later. I find it mm. kind of weird to think that uh, young Earth creationists will say, some of them will say, like, what about genetic? They'll, they'll argue that everything is running down, right? Mutations are accumulating, and they're mm -hmm. hurting organisms. They're making them less fit for their environment over time. Well, that would also destroy the pre-programming. Right, I mean, you had errors in the programs that you were going to turn on later, but now you had a mutation in them. You're now going to have to say that God is miraculously somehow maintaining the programming that he wants to use. And remember, some of that pre-programming might be programmed for 5,000 years in the future still. Right, mm -hmm. the, the argument is that it's not just pre-programming for you know the year after the fall, but it's also pre-programming for after the flood. And then it's pre-programming for, hey, the environment might change next, you know, a hundred years from now drastically. And how are organisms gonna survive? Well, maybe they already have some more pre-programming that we haven't discovered yet. And they're going to then utilize that. Mm. Um, so there is there are divergent views among young earth creations. That's why it's hard to talk about young earth creationism with this part because they don't agree with each other about this. So some are into the pre-programming. Others are more willing to admit that there's a certain amount of variation built in. That's not necessarily programming, like a trip switch that says, you come on now, you come on now. And when this happens, this will happen. Like God mm -hmm. pre-planned everything. I, I think that's very deistic, actually, in, in many ways. But um, he, some of them are more willing to say, no, there are there's genetic variation. This is the he created heterozygosity thing. There's created variation that when organisms reproduce, they recombine this variation and they create more variants, right? They create different variations of, of mm. different features. And mm. then the world out there, the environment out there goes, oh, you know what? In this new world, in this new environment, that different, that combination works, that combination works, that combination works. They're the ones that survive the best. They reproduce. They make more of those new combinations. Now this might sound familiar. That's natural selection I just described. Right, right, right. So they're they're into you create the variation and God pre pre preloaded the variation, and then the world just naturally did what it does, natural selection, and it adapted everything after that. Now you have ICR who objects to that because they see that as not involving God, and I think they have a point. You know, if if if, if younger if answers in Genesis is very much like God's in control of everything. ICR is like, well, wait a second, but you're saying that you just have random, you know, crossing back and forth, creating new variant combinations. And then <laughs> what selects everything? Oh, the environment selects it. So the environment is just sort of going through and saying, you're surviving, you're surviving, you're surviving. Well, how is that God being involved? And so they object to that. And they try to say it's all pre-programmed. Everything that ever happens is just an interaction between the environment and the pre-programming that already exists. And so we can mm. predict what will happen. We can predict the future. Natural selection says you can't really predict the future. I mean, you can predict generally what will happen in a certain environment. But if the environment changes, those organisms might change into something different uh, than I would have predicted before. So there's some interesting sort of, well, sort of, sort of philosophical differences in the approaches to like how the, the fundamental question here at the end of the day is how does God actually work in the world? Like right now, like how is he controlling things or is he not controlling uh, things? And, and, and actually a, a uniformitarian model, which ironically is exactly what biologists reasons to be like, if you, if you hold on to that, an Ecclesiastes principle, nothing new under the sun, yeah, just repeats yeah. reg, a regular regularity of, of the laws of nature, which by the way, Jeremiah thirty one, God says, I've I've made a covenant with the laws of nature and, and if they don't if they stop functioning the way they function, I might as well just give up my promises. So it's a declaration that since the laws of nature there's a regularity to it, then there's a regularity to my faithfulness. And 
yeah, that that would then fit with um, as um, I think it was um, what's his name, BB Warfield. I think it was Warfield hmm. that said um, God created creation to be creative because he you know yeah. he helped evolution and yeah yeah and and I view yeah um, I view man as being creative right that's one of the mm-hmm. that's one of the mm-hmm. things I think that establishes who we are whoops did you lose me there I'm back no, no I can hear you yeah okay yeah Jamie says uh, that I should solve the free will determinism debate so yeah <laughs> Godspeed. Yeah, but just just but, to, but, uh, yeah, just my again, point though is that it does yeah, all yeah, come back yeah. to that every time I start writing and every time I start really thinking about how the mechanisms of how things work, of course you end up there. That is where you go to every time. Mm-hmm. Is that question? Um, I've spent an enormous amount of time, you know, working with that question, and I'll tell you, I don't have the answer. I think Hugh Ross has a brilliant answer in his Beyond the Cosmos book. He engages with Einstein's famous, you know, God doesn't play dice. And Hugh Ross boldly goes, he does play dice, but he fine tunes the dice. (laughs) Um, And guess what? People play dice in the Bible. Yeah. Like they're casting lots for Matthias in Acts 1. That's the Urum Tumim. And and I and I earlier actually uh, yesterday I did a Q and A live stream on my channel and I brought this up that in Star Wars Qui Gon Jinn. So my favorite, probably the simplest way to to engage this free will determined you know thing. Watto uh, casts a uh, a dice that's already uh, pre programmed <laughs> to land not on Anakin, so he's rigged it. Mm-hmm. And Qui Gon with the Force guides it. Now, if you went with the classic understanding of the Force, the Force is this otherworldly thing that uh, can contradict the laws of nature. But if you go with the Episode One Medichlorian view, <laughs> yeah. notice it's 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 the same laws of nature that's working yeah. with the laws of nature, and it's not going down a deterministic that dice will do what gravity does with the rigging. Rather, Qui Gon is adding information to that yeah, mechanism yeah. to to tick it over that next step to then land on Anakin. Yeah. And I and and Hugh Ross is saying that that at the quantum mechanical level, if God is genuinely omniscient, well duh, there you go. Quantum <laughs> mechanics is a representation of exactly that. And if and since dice is at play with respect to God, and you have the belief that you you want him to be part of the conversation like in that you Urim Thumim stuff mm-hmm. so in other words god i know this is random to us but i want you to engage with y- your ultimate decision as well so it's it's the free will there's a genuine free will engagement with you know the sentient being and then god going all right i'll come in and work with it even though the text clearly says like hebrews 1 says you know he upholds the universe with with, with his word so there's yeah. the upholding of the laws of nature which includes quantum mechanics which includes dice-like analogies, but then, if required, he he's like Qui Gon that will, at any given moment, will make it land where he wants it to be, and um, that's Hugh Ross's argument. So he fine tunes the dice, is what Hugh Ross would say. Yeah, um, I, it's funny. You've you actually probably described if 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 I'd been forced to answer the question, I probably mm-hmm. would have done something fairly similar to that. That's kind of right. my yeah. compromise view now. Mm-hmm. Um, having come from a, or being in a strong reformed uh, tradition, I would have a, a much more God sovereign over like every single thing um, mm-hmm. in, in a very strict sense. Um, but I just, that's something I'm not comfortable with anymore, but I, it's 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 hard. The, the the whole point though is that I don't think young earth creationists really truly this is another area where they don't allow themselves to really think about these types of topics to mm-hmm. really delve into the nitty gritty of what they're saying. And this this is why I think they often contradict each other is because they don't realize that they are they're actually starting with some fairly fundamental differences 
uh, about these types of these the questions, these answers are different among different creationists. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that that's then spinning out into a, uh, an actual expression of their other views. Um, that's their big assumption. And they don't recognize mm -hmm. it. I love, they always talk about assumptions and how important they are. And you got to identify your assumptions and know those things. And I find it funny. Sometimes they don't have any idea what their basic foundation assumptions are themselves. Look at Proverbs right, I didn't, 16. I didn't know we were going to be going this direction. Was yeah, not prepared I for this. <laughs> I was just, I was just showing Jamie remind me of Proverbs. He just put Proverbs 16, 33, but there it is. The die is cast into someone's lap, yeah. but the outcome is from the Lord. There we go. So, <laughs> Um, okay. Um, how much time do you have left? Like, how long would you like this to go? Um, yeah, how about another, really only about another 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. I've let's do a, that. Yeah. Okay. Must be getting late for you. Yeah. It's like three in the morning, but yeah, it's all right. <laughs> um, just to clarify. So I have a, I have a graphic here by it's 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 actually a graphic from a great courses um mm. course called um understanding the misconceptions of science and the author of this his name is professor don lincoln fermi national mm. accelerator laboratory so he comes up with this graphic saying look the top graph is the plot so he, I'm, I'm reading what he says here. This plot yeah. has on the horizontal axis the complexity of organisms and on the vertical axis how much of life on Earth is of that amount of complexity. There is a minimum complexity of life with a big bump at, at low complexity and a long tail for more complexity. And then he goes, if evolution favors more complex creatures, you'd expect to see the bump move to the right with complex creatures becoming common but that's not what we see. Instead, you see that the bump doesn't move much and just the tail grows a little longer. And then he, so at the bottom graph, it, it's he's saying, this is not, we don't see this, not what we see. And then he says, the message here is that more than 500 million years ago, the dominant form of life was a single cell organism. Fast forward to the present and you still see that the dominant form of life on the planet is also not very complex. In fact, evolution doesn't lead to complexity. It leads to variety. And um, yeah, so, so he, in other words, he wants to say, in conclusion, he says, humans are by no means the most evolutionarily successful species on the planet. We live in a world dominated by single cell organisms. And while these organisms are less complex than multicellular life, they've been evolving over the last few billion years since our last common ancestor lived. This pushes home the message that evolution doesn't lead to complexity. The score that we, the score that we are judged against is the longevity of the species and humans have a long way to go before we can be considered a successful one. So is this in relation to what you were explaining a moment ago um. in that, in that roundabout way with the young earth's engagement with this stuff? Um, I'm not sure how, how much that relates, but I, I will say okay. that, well, let me talk, let me talk myself through this and maybe I'll come around to it. Okay. Um, so I would say maybe a better a nuance on what he's saying there is, I would say that evolution can lead to complexity, but it doesn't necessarily lead to complexity. Um, evolutionary processes lead to fit organisms for their particular environment. And bacteria are super fit for their particular environment. Uh, and so there's no reason for a bacteria to, there's no, there's no like teleological, there's no direction. Like they're like, oh, I need to become more complex. They're like that's my trajectory. I'm, I'm leading toward uh, complexity. I, they're doing exactly what they do really, really well. And they will continue to do what they do really, really well as long as the environment allows them to do that. And there's a lot of environment that allows them to do that. The other thing that I'm hit with in this, in this graphic is you, you don't, you would never have an ecosystem in which you have all, you know, mostly complex organisms. Because in this, it, there's probably an hour just talking about what complexity actually means, and they're using mm -hmm. one particular definition of complexity here. But yeah. 
just using this crude form of complexity. If you had most organisms that were complex, meaning they're macro macro organisms, because that would give you lots of features, which would kind of give you this feeling of they're complex, mm. um, then they really wouldn't be able to all survive because you think about your trophic uh, pyramid thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's an energy, it's an energy thing. You need to generate a massive amount of energy to support those upper members of the com of the complexity uh, realm. And so you need a large number of simple organisms to be alive doing what they're doing and producing the energy that then can get cascaded up to more complex things. And so, and that's the way, only way you can actually make complex things too, is you have to have an enormous amount of energy available uh, to them in order for them to explore that space of complexity. Uh, and that's one of the reasons you have direction may, where it feels like you have, well, I don't know, maybe you do have direction to, if you start with bacteria, some bacteria can explore that new space of complexity because there's a lot of energy around that they can obtain from other organisms and materials that are being produced by those organisms. But most of the bacteria continue to just be bacteria because it's a very comfortable space to be in and they're well, they're well uh, adapted to it. So in a new environment, some organisms can go on and explore other more complicated ways to live in those more complicated environments. Once all the environments are filled up though, you're going to have lots of organisms that that this the more efficient way to survive is to be smaller and use less energy and to be adapted to multiple different like environmental parameters and bacteria mm -hmm. are really good at that so yeah. in that way they are more complex in the sense that they can actually live in this amazing crazy world whereas you throw some of those multicellular complex organisms into their world they won't survive Mm. Um, and maybe the ultimate, the ultimate, you know, definition of complexity is, is, is maybe your survival itself. Mm. Mm. Um, so, so, so just, yeah, just to, all right. just maybe to clarify, to that in. yeah, yeah. Just to clarify in the paraphrase, what you said and how I understood it is the bottom. And he says, this is not what we see. Is he basically saying, this is the perception that the young creationists have that this is how they think evolution works, where you're going from, like, you know, Ken Owen is famous for this, from yeah. simple to complex. Yeah. When really complexity is all about how you've explained it, which is this bit here. And in other words, by the time you reach humans, it, uh, humans should... Sh so what basically is saying multicellular phyla, I don't know if that's the correct term, but yeah. multicellular, you know, creatures are actually more subject to extermination purely because of the lack of sufficiency or, or, or efficiency that obviously a bacteria yeah. would, would have or, rather than a, say, human hominid. Or, or there can only be so many of them, right, in, in a certain amount of right. space. There's only a certain amount of resource. And if you're a large organism, a large complex organism, you only have so many resources available to you. So you can only so many can survive. You, so you're much more susceptible to extinction because of that. Right. And so the fact that we do exist means what would be then the, the, the implication of the ramification? Like if you were to, I mean, the fact that you and I actually exist, right, means that's pretty amazing. And yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, it's, I guess you could, well, let's, I mean, to use some evolution language, you could say it, com, highly complex organisms are built on the history of simpler organisms that have laid the groundwork and allowed complex organisms to even exist. Hmm. Um, but you couldn't start, you couldn't start with just a complex organism with nothing else. That complex organism actually has to live and survive in an environment with all those other organisms and resources available to them. Hmm. Hmm. So you can only start with simple organisms that, uh, um, that only need a, a few parameters uh, for life. Uh, and, and take advantage of certain resources that are just available in the general environment. But eventually when you get to complex organisms, they're using resources from that other smaller organisms have made and you're just recycling them, hmm. right? I mean, right. everything you and I eat is something that something else made. I mean, we're reconfiguring our molecules, uh, you know, and doing a bunch of biochemistry, but essentially you still have to eat plants. You have to eat something that's something else biochemically generated. Uh, mm. And plants are even then taking minerals and new, they're taking nitrogen from the soil, which a bacteria had to process from the air to mm -hmm. generate that nitrogen so the plant could survive. Right, uh, the right. plant couldn't do it really without the fungi and the bacteria in the soil. Uh, right. 
you know, right. that's why in the Martian, you know, he had to plant his plants inside <laughs> of his own poop because there's really no yeah. resources on Mars, right? There's no organic material and there's no pre-biochemistry that has been done there to provide the resources for you to be able to do anything. Mm -hmm. so to grow a complex organism, you'd have to start with bacteria that can live in that kind of crazy environment, which would then build the environmental landscape, including the atmosphere, which then would allow us to have complex organisms. Mm. And as as he said, let's science the uh, the S out of this. <laughs> yeah. <All> right. <laughs> but then that I think that's I think this is an excellent graphic to end this excellent discussion on yeah. uh, Joe because I, I think in, in a nutshell because I came across this last minute a couple of days ago and mm. I think this really then highlights then yeah this this in a nutshell is is those who strong an evolution you perceive it this way but really it is it is this mm -hmm. and uh, and that's yeah that I think that that solves a lot of the misunderstandings um, so yeah, thanks, thanks, Joel, for taking your time and. and well, again, thanks for yeah. letting me join you, and uh, this is great. I, it's been a great challenge to think through some, uh, you know, think through topics that I didn't know I was going to talk about. That's that's, and as I said, it's it's going to be one of those, you know, pretty chill, but I, oh, at the same time, I'm not afraid to delve in. And yeah, uh, God bless you, and again, blessings for the rest of the day, and. Hope you have a good weekend ahead and um yeah, keep in touch and we'll see if we can do this again sometime and further the discussion. So Thanks. You too. Okay. All right. See you folks. Bye I'm gonna you. end the stream now. <laughs>